The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies, but also by the generous donations of you, the listener. Many thanks goes out to Peter West, Keith Erickson, Ben Oberhauser, David Jackhausen, Dean Clark, Alex McIntosh, James Richards, Tobias Whiting, and Marcus Wheeler. Guys, thank you once again for your generous support. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast, episode 177. Imperial Skies, with hosts Neil Shook, Mike Hobbs and Mike Whittaker, and guest Robin Fitton. Welcome to another episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. I'm Neil Shuck, and once again, I am joined by the rejuvenated Welsh wizard. Hello, Mr. Hobbs. Are you better? Hello, world. Yes, I am better. Excellent. I am alive. (laughs) You see, Mr. Whittaker, it failed again. But you were so close this time, Mike. You always got me. Dang. Annie, get with the program. I even saw her at Partizan to commission it as well. (laughs) He drunk the flagon with the dragon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> true, it wasn't the vessel with the pestle. Yeah. <laughs> or is that the brew that is true? Yeah. It, was, it, was it with the poison is the vessel with the pestle, the flagon with the dragon is the brew that is true? Or something like that. I uh, think we got it wrong. Yeah, I think we did. I, 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 I'll, I I'll, I'll, I'll have words with Annie and we'll, we'll sort it out for next time. <laughs> it was very close, though. I, w- I was very bad. <laughs> Pro- proper poorly, he was. Proper poorly. The term I used to kneel earlier was, I was empty. <laughs> <laughs> That's never good. That's no, never good. No, I, no. I was bereft. <laughs> that's, that's, just, that's, just, that's just wrong. I'm sorry. Both just, ends? Uh, 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 Mr. Whittaker, please step away. <laughs> step away from the subject and nothing more to see here. <laughs> Is that far enough? <laughs> yes. You can come back now, Mike. How's that? Much better. And ying tong, ying tong, ying tong, ying tong, ying tong. <laughs> <laughs> say, special effects provided by the Good Show. Yes. Circa 1952. <laughs> they don't make them like that anymore. Uh, no. <laughs> Except on this podcast. So, if you've just joined us and wondering what the heck you're listening to, yeah, this is the yes, this is once again the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. And why Neil hasn't introduced me yet. Uh, well, I did kind of vaguely. Mr. Whittaker, uh, Trouble at Mill. Mr. Chuck. How are you, sir? You well? Uh, it's hot. It's Friday. Um, it's post-GCSE results. What more can we say? How did you do? I didn't do I, I didn't take him. Son was too great short of what he wanted, but he's got a place elsewhere, oh. so I think we're sorted. And, and Josh is claiming he hasn't had his yet. Really? Yeah, yeah. He didn't bother going down. He's he, yeah. He's waiting for it to, he's waiting to get his in the post. So that's a, it's a considerably more laid back approach than most. Yes, people have. yeah. He, well, it's his it's his second retake of English, so you know <laughs> you can't really blame him. <laughs> Fair enough. Get him in the army. That's what I say. <laughs> Sign him up. Make yep. a man of him. And get that spare room to, to convert. <laughs> this war game room. Yes, indeed. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So here we are. Yes, recording on a uh, yes, recording on a Friday as opposed to a Wednesday. Two days closer to Heverwood. Uh, how's it all going, Mike? Oh, it's getting there. We we have a, a floor plan. It's 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 only slightly screwed up by the fact that people various at least one person can't make it, and one person who we're hoping was going to make it can't make it. So it's going all right. Um, we have a tape floor plan. We have a trader plan. Uh, we have some freebie miniatures from Gripping Beast. Uh, what else have we got? Um, we have a free PA system, so I don't need to bring my own this year. Uh, it's all getting there slowly. Cool. Uh, yes, and uh, and yes, later on in this program, well, if you're listening to this be- before Heberwood, because hopefully this will be out 
kind of a couple of days before Haywood. We talk later in the program because we recorded this interview last week uh, about the possibility of Robin Fitton being on the brigade stand and doing demos of Imperial Skies. Unfortunately, Robin now can't make it. That's a, that's yep. kind of official. Uh, uh, yep. That was kind of confirmed. Uh, funny enough, today. Crying shame, actually, as we even have a table spare for it. Indeed. Bit of a shame, but never mind. So what have you got in store for you this evening? Well, I mean, I've already trailed the fact that we've got Robin Fitton on the show. That's our main interview, uh, talking about all brand new Imperial Skies, so you know, flying battleships, and and that uh, that's our uh, that's our main feature for the show. Uh, other than that, uh, we've got well, we're going to chat about what we've been up to because we've been busy, been here, there, and everywhere, and uh, we're going to ha- talk a little bit about some, about some hobby news, and uh, then. Uh, we're not going to do a mini review this month uh, or this this time round, but we do have a, a rather large mailbag. Now, uh, I did put out there. That's entirely your. It thoughts. is. I did put out there. So, oh, by the way, we're, we're recording, and have you got any questions for the mailbag? And several of you uh, were wonderful in dropping out questions. Massively wonderful, involved questions, <laughs> all sorts of stuff, which are brilliant, but more than we can probably fit into one one show. So that's enough to keep us going for at least a couple. Uh, but it does mean that we're going to have um, a bit of a longer mailbag, we, and we're not going to have a review this time, although we will be chatting about two or three games, I'm sure, during our what we've been up to. Uh, so that's what we've got in store. So I think we'll uh, take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, well, we'll be uh, catching up with uh, what we've been doing in the last couple of weeks. I must get through to Sergeant Watson's position. Jenkins, cover me! Sergeant Watson, bring your men in. Withdraw. Oh, it's all right, sir. We're enjoying ourselves. What? Yes, sir. It's these here chain of command rules, sir. We're having great fun. Chain of command? That's right, sir. It's a challenging but fun blend of command and control. It gives me the freedom I want to fight the way I want to. Never had so much fun, sir. But we've cooked you some sausages. Can't be helped, sir. Me and the lads are staying put. Chain of command, World War II, platoon level rules from two fat lardies. They really put you in control. And they're even better than sausages. What have we been playing? What have we been buying? We might even have painted something. The Meeples and Miniatures crew reveal all. So, time to chat about what we've been up to. You already asked me. No, I, no, all I asked was how was Howard going? Is that all you've been up to? Well, not quite. Shall I continue? <laughs> Go on, then. <laughs> Come on. The suspense uh, is killing me. Uh, what have we done? Andy and Andy, um, if you remember those who came to Harrowwood or Partisan, did a very nice, many, many would be king participation game which they're doing the sequel to as i may have mentioned before there has been much more wielding of blue foam and power tools and it all looks very very nice indeed um it's gonna look really rather good um we've also got the club's also been knocking together another game for the show which is actually heroine's attack on peterborough's just so those of you don't know who the heck heroine was and why we're calling this show the heroine war game show can find out um, cool, war games and history, whatever next. <laughs> whatever next, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, played some Kings of War. All right. And lost. Making a mental note that I need to spend less points on things, on skills I don't know how to use, and buy yet more heavy cavalry. Mm. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. So well, what you're telling me then is that you lost because you failed to charge. 
No, I lost because I lost because I was rubbish. No, no, you you you, you had you didn't have enough heavy cavalry. Therefore, you failed to charge properly. Mm, I failed to charge with enough heavy cavalry. Uh, yeah, you failed to my, charge. Properly. Yeah, there are there are points wasted on things that weren't particularly useful. And if I save all the points I've I've wasted, I could probably buy yet another horde of heavy cavalry and have even more fun and mayhem. <sighs> and suddenly Neil is interested. No, I'm I'm just sitting here going, oh, we have a power game in our midst. No, no, we have someone who understands how to do one thing well in Kings of War. It's not really power gaming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I'm just pleased that and that one thing is charge with heavy cavalry. Uh, well, so, you should understand that fairly well. Well, I'm, 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 it sounds like I've got a convert. God. Yeah, well, I, I always did. I mean, it's just basically piles of Normans, piles of Parthians being used as Kingdom of Men, heavy cavalry, going crunch thud. They just need a bit more support, that's all. Also going crunch thud. <laughs> I was going to say a bit more thud and a bit more crunch. Yeah, <laughs> a bit more crunch and a bit more thud, yeah, basically. Excellent, sir. Uh, that's pretty much it, I think. Um, still lots of tanks being played around the cub, showing what's now a week and a bit. Uh, are you at the don't panic, Mr. Mannering bit? Are you? Uh, we're doing all right. We'll get there. <laughs> It'll be good. Uh, lots of we, we're up to twenty eight traders and I think twenty six games, so it should look pretty good. Oh, cool! That's good. That's really good. Um, had we landed Mantic at the point I spoke last? We did. Yes. 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 I can't remember whether it was off the record at that point. Oh, maybe. Uh, maybe it may have been off the record. If yeah. it, if it was off the record, then can I note that uh, in addition to our bunch of traders, Mantic games are turning up. Cool. Is one coming? Possibly. Because I, I, I quite surprisingly spotted him at Partisan. Yeah, he was he was there briefly at Partisan. Yeah, and uh, I, yeah, I, yeah, I completely failed to call to him and ask him about Kings of War historical. But ah, that, which is of, which is of course the other thing we did this week, <laughs> namely went to Partisan. Indeed. Yeah. Well, so you two tell me all about Partisan, right? Or Partisan. The, well, actually, um, actually, we'll tell you about the other Partisan. The other part of correct, yeah. yes. So, George Stevenson Hall, lovely, big, light, airy, less of a howling gale through the, through, with the doors open the last time, which was quite nice. Uh, we took the um, 54 mil game that we took to the Royal Armouries, which went down well, it was kind of fun. Lots of very, very nice games. Mm. There were several games of sharp practice. Three, um, I think. Three. Interesting. Mm. I mean, on the subject of sort of scenery topics we've discussed over the last few episodes, uh, there were three different games with differently painted and textured realm of battle boards, including Mr. Clark's, mm -hmm. and all one with desert texture, one with a sort of um, arid Africa texture, and the other I'm disremembering, but also looked very pretty. Uh, and there were three three sharp practice games, I think. Matt Slade had one. Yeah, but that that, yeah. Uh, uh, that was one. yeah. The Matt Slade one was a forty mil ACW, 40 mil, which, which was yeah. which was very pretty. It was all slash and saber figures, um, which will be coming to Harrywood. Oh, that that's a very pretty game. Uh, uh, there was Mister Clark's Darkest Africa, mm. which will also be coming to Harrywood, and sadly not coming to Harrywood. There was an absolutely beautiful eighteen twelve retreat from Moscow game. From the Harrogate guys on a cigar box mat. Yes, yes, I saw, I saw pictures of that. Stunning. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. Very, it, it was very nice. It, it was, was very, very. Didn't pretty. that? Didn't that win best in the show or something like? That, uh, I, I it thought. won best participation game and the Lardy's game won best demonstration game, which is a fairly big victory for sharp practice, I'd say. Yeah, I saw pictures of that retreat from Moscow one and. It just flooded back what we were talking about a few months ago, Mike, about doing a... Just, oh, oh, my God, we have to do that, and now you see why. Yeah. Yes, um, it was very nice. And it it was lovely. Interestingly enough, one of the Realm of Battle Boards, uh, I, I seem to remember, was actually the 30K game. Was that the 30K uh, game? That, uh, 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 I think it was, yes. Uh, they're also a heroine, by the way. Uh, yeah, but funny enough, even they covered the skulls up. Yes, there have been a lot of covering up till it's going on. And it, yeah, it, it, I just found it ironic that that the guy displaying the 30k game had still covered the skulls up, <laughs> which was actually a very nice game. It was. It looked. It looked. It looked very impressive. super looking board, mm. and that also will be a Harrowood. So just to prove that we don't neglect the Games Workshop, we've 
not only got a 30k game, we have a Warhammer Fantasy Ninth Age game coming as well. Mm. But so it's uh, all manner of fun stuff. Very high quality uh, games in both the pop, excuse me, in both participation and the demo games. Yep. Um, the um, British Civil War, very British Civil War forums game looked really nice. Yes, there was a. That's also coming to Harrowwood. Is it... <laughs> Hang on, you're just turning this into an advert for Harrowwood again, aren't you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. uh, there was a, a game. Uh, was it 1859 Second uh, Second Italian Unification Wars uh, in 20 million? That's that was... not coming to Harrowwood. No, but that was <laughs> that was very pretty. Uh, that was very impressive. A uh, lot of very very good looking games. The yes. Grimsby guys had their big naval thing again. Yes. Uh, uh, apparently, what they uh, uh, apparently what they done this time is that they decided that uh, it was taking too long to play last time, so they decided to play all f- uh, uh, all four days together. <laughs> this time, round, apparently, oh, <laughs> as opposed to playing it a day at a time. Yeah, hundreds of Langton ships, lovely, and and yeah, oh, yes, yeah, generally very very good uh, level of games there. Very high, show very wise, high standard of games. Yeah. Traders, uh, the traders I spoke to were really impressed with the whole thing. Uh, uh you know, they the were. The usual bunch. But, 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 but yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, I mean, all the, but, but what I was saying was that they were, they were all impressed with the new venue. So how much did you spend? How much did I spend? Uh, £6.25. Oh, gosh, I win just 20 quid. So was it busy? Yeah, uh, it was pretty busy. It was I pretty mean, busy. Base- Basically, I bought um, some trees because I deliberately not brought any of the club stash because I wanted to see what the you know the tree fellas yes. who were tucked away oh, in the corner. Um, I, I like thought, him. I thought I'd pick up some of their trees rather than some Las Valley ones just to be different. Mm-hmm. So since that, since I'd spotted on the plan that we were right next to them, I thought I won't bring any club trees. I'll pop over before we start, and I got six of their trees for twenty quid, and they look really good. He's, he's a nice guy, the tree fella. Yeah, Lovely. the the thing he has over Last Valley is that he does fifteen mil as well and ten mil. I think Last Valley has a wider range, so they you know they they're obvious they're obvious competition for each other, but they don't completely overlap. Yeah, I, I mean, as far as the show itself is concerned, there was I mean there was a nice buzz around the show, so, so, certainly for the length of time I was there. Apparently, the um, couple of traders were saying that that. It, it wasn't quite as busy as the May show, but I mean, first off, the autumn show n- never, never was. Uh, it that always seems to be the one that is slightly quieter than the May show. But of course, I mean, I was wondering, um, how much, you know, it being in the middle of August would affect it. But according to Steve Jones's site, they had over 750 visitors. So, you know, it's not bad. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought I thought I thought it was a really good show and and uh, yeah. something of a return to form for partisan. Especially since I didn't go to them. I, I know uh, Mr. Whitaker went to the um, May show, but I didn't. But uh, but yeah, I thought it was I thought it was it was definitely return to form. And certainly having had a, quite a long chat with Steve Jones about it, the New York regulars are much much happier with the new. I day. can't say I'm surprised. Mm. Um, my only comment really is. What's the difference between the two shows? Was there ever a difference between the two? The the, the only thing I had noticed is they moved a bit closer together in time because there was a time when when Partizan was April. Yeah, two weeks after so May this yeah. May this year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The problem is you now have three shows in that venue which are very very similar. Mm. Yes, um, because uh, yes, because Hammerhead's now changed, isn't it? Because Hammerhead has ceased Hammerhead's to be there as well. Um, yeah, and, Hammer, and Hammer, Hammerhead has ceased to be the the sci fi and fantasy show that it used to be, and he's now hasn't been, uh, hasn't been for as long as I've been going there, which admittedly isn't as long as some of you grizzled veterans. Oh well, uh, well, I, I, I remember Hammerhead when Hammerhead used to be sci fi and fantasy partisan. There you go. Before Cogs took it over, and you see, Cogs don't even run it anymore. But yeah, it was when it was when it, it was when it was the new Oki regular uh, sci-fi and fantasy partisan back yeah, in the day. That's 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 before I started going because I think it was certainly run by Cogs the first year I went. Yeah, but yeah, um, it's, it's not really a criticism. It's just there are three shows in the same venue and they they do blur into one, but not necessarily in a bad way. Hmm. By night, you mean? 
And of course, now, as you said, now with uh, now with the fact that obviously because you now nicked Partizan's old slot, uh, it, it, it was available. Yeah, there was no larceny involved. No, okay, but basically now, as I say, now so, so now you have that. Then you have Heavenwood two weeks later, uh, yeah. and then of course there's this. Uh, well, as we're recording this tomorrow. Um, because uh, on on Saturday this is on the show over in Telford. Uh, no, uh, well I'm going to go and have a look, see what it's like. Excellent. Uh, so I'll I'll let you know on the next show. Right, cool. So yes, but Partizan, yeah, big thumbs up. Good show, yeah, excellent show. Um, surprised how little I spent because <laughs> I was partly saving it for Harrowwood because <laughs> it's after payday. It's uh, when I post up what I bought, people are going, Neil, what's wrong? What's what, the you, matter? what have you done with Neil? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's that's pretty much me. So as we've sort of drifted onto you, would you like to carry on? Uh, oh yeah, okay. Right, right. Yeah, it's been quite a busy time because yeah, we did partisan on the Sunday. Uh the previous day, uh I I'd done a day trip to Somerset. Uh, I know I must be mad. Uh I've been down to uh, Shetton Mallet, uh home of um Spartan Games. Uh, got invited down to play Halo Grand Command. Uh, so met up with Neil Fawcett and Rich Jones. Rich Jones, uh, a friend of the show. Well, more than a friend of the show. Uh, so Rich says hi. Yeah, he was down there as well. And uh, so actually, it turns out that Rich taught us how to play Halo Grand Command. <laughs> and Neil kind of heckled. Uh, and then chatted and, and chatted about uh, ch- ch- chatted about uh, a load of stuff, which unfortunately I'm not allowed. To, I'm not allowed to tell anybody about at the moment. <laughs> and, and it's probably connecting with the fact that sadly Spartan have had to pull out of Harrowwood because Dan's going to be in the states. Ah, yes, uh, yeah, oh, that's a shame. But yeah, so I got to play Halo Grand Command for the first time. I am going to write. Well, hopefully by the time you listen to this, I, I will have written my kind of th- first thoughts on Halo Grand Command. But uh, yeah, nice system, very nice system. It's a, it's a very much uh, it's very much a uh, alternate unit activation. Alternate unit activation farming works in in a similar sort of way to the way it works in Halo Fleet battles. You know, with, you know, with firepower and uh, the the custom dice and that sort of thing, and you get exploding dice and what have you. Really interesting thing, in, in, I mean, as Neil talked about, is the fact that you have this thing called reaction, where essentially every every unit is is on permanent Overwatch, and whenever you move a unit, one of your opponent's units can, should they so wish, react to it. So it's very very interactive, very backwards and forwards, and uh, yeah, uh, really really impressed. Even better that I won. Yes, I was playing. The, I was playing the Covies. Josh was playing. Uh, 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 Josh was playing uh, USNC, and yes, I won. Did you buy it? Did I buy it? No, I didn't buy it because I couldn't buy it, and for, I was. I was really, really. I, I actually went down with the full intention of buying it <laughs> and, and bought <laughs> me some money. Uh, unfortunately, no, they have some production issues. So yes, unfortunately, couldn't buy it because obviously at the moment they're concentrating on getting it out to the two thousand odd people who have pre-ordered it and haven't had it yet. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Apparently they have caught. Well, understandably, and he'll put his hands up and say, "Yeah, we know we ca- we, yeah we're catching a lot of flack for it," and uh, and understandably, uh, you know, he's Neil's a pretty customer uh, upfront, customer facing guy. So yeah, uh, yeah, I think he's quite. Um, yeah, he's not, he's he's not happy about the situation, but they're doing all they can to mm. uh, 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 to rectify it as quick as possible. But they are, uh, uh, yeah, they're a bit behind. Oh dear, I'm sure they'll get it sorted. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, suffice it to say, it's a great game, and yeah, got to see. Uh, well, we, we were chatting about some, uh, some of the things that are coming out. Uh, basically, we've got the first three waves. Uh, we've got kind of loads of fly stuff. No, sorry, we've got lo- we we got like tanks and stuff coming out. Then we've got flyers and stuff coming out, and then we've got drop troopers coming out. Loads of stuff before Christmas. Loads and loads of stuff coming before Christmas. So yeah, but basically they have they they have a very busy production plan uh, yeah. before Christmas, and then after Christmas they have something huge. So very very busy time, and in, even in the meantime, uh, they've got some really big plans for some of their other game systems. Uh, 
Yeah, and one of which is incredibly exciting and I know will interest you, Mr. Hobbs, because you're a big fan of this particular part of their universe. But uh, but more than that, I currently cannot say, at least not live on air. Okay. So <laughs> I'll tell you in a bit. <laughs> yeah, tell me later. <laughs> But yeah, no. So, so, uh, so, so yeah, no. A, fanta- a fantastic day at Spartan. Thanks to the guys for um, yeah for inviting us down. And uh, uh, yeah, had, uh, so but yeah, had a had a great day. Though, although I must admit, by the time we got home in the evening, I was I was a bit shattered. Yeah. So uh, that was that. And then uh, what else have I been doing? Haven't managed any painting uh, because I've been busy like editing and stuff. Played another new game. Uh, this week, uh, I finally got to play a game of Poseidon's Warriors, which is, uh, Osprey Ancient War Galleys, uh, game written by John Lambshead. People might have seen, seen a few weeks ago, I, uh, uh, I bought some, um, sheets of Punic Wars War Galleys from, uh, ti- uh, from, to- from to- Tiny Tin Troops, I think it was, uh, cause they did some of these top, these top down, War galleys, which was which were rather nice, and I, I, I put them on the phone phone call and everything. I I, I, I got all infused, and uh, I was uh, I was looking forward to playing that. Oh dear! Uh, you say you were looking forward. To I was looking forward, looking forward to playing that. Me and Dave played it last night. Uh, I will I will put a, I will put a full review on the blog. <sighs> what can I say? I, I know I'm going to alienate some people <laughs> potentially because <laughs> with this next statement. If you like DBA, you will probably like this. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very much uh, movement micromanagement. Plus, okay, you're operating with um, squadrons of ships, which have to stay in formation. Uh, I mean, we only played with, like, fleet... Uh, I mean, I mean it's, it's very... Fa- it's quite fast play. Uh, I think it's meant to be very, kind of quite quick and bloody. But relies an awful lot on rolling sixes although it's alternate unit activation especially once you get especially once you get close to each other of course it's all about ramming ships so if you get close to each other uh, and you're both within ramming range it basically boils down to whoever wins initiative you know um yeah. it's okay. I, I mean yeah. I'll, as i say i'll put a a, a bit more of a, an in-depth thing uh, uh, review on the blog. I'm sure it will appeal to some people. I personally didn't like it. Uh, Dave hated it. <laughs> uh, he he really wasn't impressed. I I, I was a bit frustrated with it. Um, I, I, I thought it I, I thought it it might have been better than it was. But at the same time, maybe it's just one of those things of it's just not that not sort of game that I normally play i normally enjoy you know it's not that i don't enjoy playing naval games because some naval game you know some naval games i, I, I do enjoy but uh not that one unfortunately a bit of a disappointment oh, okay anything else i've been doing no not really as i say went to parties and bought uh yes bought uh yes three pots of paint well two pots of paint and a medium so uh i'm I, I, i'm actually getting quite enthused about um Quite confused about uh, paint uh, about painting loads of different bits and pieces. Uh, although I've undercoated my uh, Norman cavalry, uh, there's, there's a whole load of stuff all, all of a sudden which I'm kind of thinking, oh, I need to do this and I need to do that. And I, 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 you know, I want to paint Planetfall. Um, I want to paint Halo. And uh, I, I know Keith Erickson's uh, going, going, what about your six mil? What about your six mil French? What, what have they done to you? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't you forgotten the... some sleeves. I paint some sleeves, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I, I mean, I have, to be honest, the last couple of weeks, I, I, you know, the, oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Remember being infused about this thing? You're like, okay, you're doing half an hour's painting a day. Yeah, that's not really happened a lot for a while. So I, I need to kind of try and get back into that a bit more. But uh, so, so no painting done so far. Although, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, look, uh, I'm looking at my cavalry now. I think I need to get on those, but I, I also want to, you know, do that and, and paint some your ball stuff and just paint some figures and get playing and I know there's a couple of games that uh, I can paint some stuff relatively quickly and get playing with them so which is why probably the Norman Cavalry are going to be on the shelf for a couple of weeks while I do a couple of the bits and pieces but that's me stick the riders from the saddles <laughs> no 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 I'm going to do it 
No, uh, yes, I, yes, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Everybody, 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 all my all, everybody bar one has told me I'm wrong. And that's not the first time recently that you have discovered the useful piece of advice after you've done something. Are we talking about car protectors? <laughs> yes, didn't Hobbsy point something out to you on Twitter after you'd done it? Oh, this morning. About car protectors? Yeah, well, why yeah. don't you just do this? <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it didn't take me that long. It was only... It, 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 yeah, it, yeah, it took me half an hour. But... But having done it, I wasn't going to take them all out again. <laughs> I say, do they fit in the box? No, no, <laughs> no, they don't. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, as, as as loads of people pointed out, yeah, you know, just buy a deck box. So yeah, so I, I probably will just buy a deck box. But uh, but yeah, it was um, yeah, it was fun. Um, you'll probably find that Rift have them at Harrowwood. <laughs> How would you say? <laughs> Mike, Mike, are you are, 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 are we running a competition for the for the amount of times that you can get the words that Herowood? No, they are coming to Herowood. Well, I was try I was trying to be helpful because Rift happened to sell a lot of Magic the Gathering stuff, and they always have de- deck boxes. Otherwise, you're gonna have to mail order them. And let's be honest, Neil. Last year, he didn't shut up about Herowood for about three months. We can give him one episode this year. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, I, we'll I, give I, you I, one I, episode I, just I, before. I, I didn't shut up about Aaron because no bleep would stop asking me about it. We're excited. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So either either that or or, or possibly even at this uh, p- possibly even at this, uh, at this other show tomorrow. Uh, we'll see. We'll wait and see. Yeah, but but yes, that is the other thing. Uh, uh, I was um, uh, uh, I had Mister Luff drooling over Bluka last night, so it looks like the next thing we're going to be pl- next new game we're going to be playing is Bluka. Just play with the cards. Well, we are, yeah, we are, uh, yeah. That's it. Uh, that, yeah, that's the idea. We're gonna, we're gonna play with the cards, but I mean, Dave wants to play it in six. You know, with six mil. Yeah. Uh, so, so we will be going there eventually, but obviously, we'll learn the game with the cards know. and then kind of go there. Just get David to do both armies. Makes sense. That's what I do. I'm hurt. <laughs> I'm practical. <laughs> go on, obviously, get on with it. Uh, okay. Time for, oh, my life. Time for me, t- t- time for me to get my own back on you. Oh my yeah. word, obviously. What have you been doing? <laughs> um, made a few purchases. <laughs> a few, a few. I bought some paints. Did I mention, did, I, I might mention this last, last time. I can't remember. Yeah. Bought some, oh, lots of paints. You, you splurged at Foundry, as I gather. I, I did splurge a foundry, yeah. So a hundred quid of a paint to top oh, up the ones I had. Is this your annual splurge at foundry, is it? I do do an annual paint splurge at a foundry, which normally is just top up the ones I've already got, but I decided to buy their entire artillery selection, which is fantastic. I tell you what, oh, there's some fantastic paints in there. Um, they do all the colours for the, for the um, Napoleonic limbers, which are good, but they do um, a brass barrel colour. For British guns, which is lovely, for, uh, uh, tri- uh, triad. Black and barrels, which is like a very, very dark black metallic colour. Uh, and just, yeah, um, red ochres and uh, some really nice colours in there. Which meant I have to rearrange my painting desk. Um, <laughs> to get it all to fit. So there's that. I bought Battle Law. You, you told me to. I, I didn't tell you to buy Battle Law. You did in the last show. You told me to buy Battle Law. I didn't tell you to buy Battle Law. I just you said did. it was good. <laughs> you did. You said buy it for research purposes. I, I, so I, 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 you I remember no yeah. such conversation. I, I think I think you'll find it in the last show. <laughs> so I, I bought that and I played that and I like it. And you I'm like- not going to paint. I'm not going to paint the figures. That's very sen- that's a ve- that's a very sensible decision. You not painting the figures. However, I did tell you you were going to like it, didn't I? You did. It's very good. Very, very. And, and how exactly was he going to like it without buying it, Neil? Because because all actually they have they, they have this wonderful app, don't they, Michael? Yeah, bought, yeah, bought that as well. <clears throat> but I, I I bought the the, um, the PC version. Which is on Steam, yeah. Called uh, called Battle or Command, which is actually a very good. Uh, it's a very good port of the game onto uh, onto PC. 
yeah, it's very, very good. If, if you want to learn the game, get Battle or Command. It was, it cost me six, six pounds something, six, six ninety nine. Yeah. There's a few minor changes to the game, just on some of the, the card abilities. Um, but yeah, it's a great game. Really, really good. So I've been playing that a lot. I bought, uh, an old Lardy's game, La Fou Sacra. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Napoleonic game. Their, their larger scale Napoleonic game, isn't it? La Fou Sacra? Yes. Um, because I bought Napoleon's Grand Battles last month. Uh, or Grand Battles Napoleon, sorry. Um, so I'm looking at ways of using my 15 mil Waterloo figures. So I thought I'd have a look at a few you could, always use, you could always use Napoleon at war. You could do, yeah, I've got that as well. So I'm going to play around with all three of them and see which Sport one I prefer. Choice he is. There's well, also it. the um, Chain of Command based variant. There's the Napoleonic system yeah. that's it's... been play tested by the Lardies. Use it using chain of command type activation. Yes, uh, which is quite fun. Yes, I, I, I'm going to look at that. And that, that that that's based on the Fusaka, isn't it? But it's using uh, it's not kind using kind of sort of ish, maybe. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, I'm going to do a bit of that, a bit of a bit of 15 mil large scale Napoleonic, as I've got figures there. Hmm. Interestingly, and uh, and uh, it, rather unusually, I must admit, Lefou Sucker is is one of the few Lardy games that didn't really grab me. It was one of the few ones that because uh, uh, I, I had it, and um, yeah, that was that was one, one of the very few Lardy games that I didn't quite get on with. Yeah, well, I thought I'd have a look at it, mm. you know, and and just just to be good, so I did that. Um... Playing wise, I've been playing Command and Colors Ancients and Battle Law and nothing else. Cool. I've done some painting. I've I finished up um, revitalizing a whole bunch of um, riflemen, which I bought at the Firestorm Bing and Buy back in April. So they're done and ready for sharp practice. Oh right, yeah, I remember you doing that. Yeah. yeah I finished my uh, my twenty more Germans. So that force is done. Oh, oh, I see. Been finishing stuff. Wow. Yeah. I, I cool. finished the whole force. Although I do need some more vehicles, which I'll get in next year. And then I had a trip to Lard Island, which we can gloss over. So, what's the next show up section? <laughs> what, what this is, of course, what, what, entirely unconnected with your f- f- ensuing illness. No, 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 uh, no, I'm, no I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Whitaker. What happens in Lard Island stays in Lard Island. Yes. Yes. I got well, it. Although the the one picture and its and and its accompanying quote uh, tweeted by Mister Skinner um, has become uh, one of my tweets of the year. Uh, unfortunately, because it's a family show, I can't actually say the quote. <laughs> but it's, uh... <laughs> it's a very pretty gnome. <laughs> No, it wasn't that one. <laughs> it wasn't that one. It was the, it was the, um, it was the. Oh, the yeah. Oh, said Piglet. What, uh, what should we do now? Let's go and get. Says Pooh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I I went for a um, a photo session. We decided we needed some photographs for the for the book. So I took all my figures down there, and the plan was we take some photographs, and then we're gonna have a beer. So I got there. We went for a beer straight away and a pizza. <laughs> then we went back and had a game and took some photographs. Then we realised the light was all wrong, so we went to the pub at four o'clock. Oh, right, so you didn't actually blue, achieve yeah. what you went down there for? Uh, yeah, Rich got up at five o'clock the next morning and took the rest of the photographs. Oh, right, oh, oh, right, so you left, so you, left, you left your figures down there? Yeah. Yeah, and then they um, gave me the, the, the guided tour of St. Albans. I, I saw the cathedral, I saw the park, I saw the Roman wall, I saw the lake, which was dug by the unemployed in 1932, and I saw the inside of about a dozen pubs. <laughs> um, and the curry. No, we went to a nice restaurant. We had a bit of steak. You didn't have a curry? No. Wow. No, we, we decided to be um, civilised. <laughs> After the dozen pubs. After the dozen pubs, yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. So, there we go. So, word of warning, don't ever go on a pub call with the lardies. It's hardcore. 
Or at least don't go and try to keep up. <laughs> I survived. <laughs> <laughs> Only just. <laughs> just, just. Yes, this bodes well for uh, Larden uh, for Larden Five. Uh, yes, <clears throat> we got Larden to get through first in October. Oh, old oh, oh, I was forgetting about Lardif. We'll come back to that in the next episode. Indeed, yeah, I, 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 I completely forgot about that. You, have to, you shall have to tell us all about that, Mike. But not today, because today we are sponsored by Hellwood. <laughs> <laughs> Which is taking place when, Mike? Oh, uh, week on Sunday, although by the time you hear this, probably this Sunday. Yes. Yeah, that's the 4th of September for people who, uh, yeah. Yeah, four, Sunday, 4th of September at... The Crescent, Peterborough, just off the A47. It's on the website, which is heroin-wargames.co.uk. Can I stop plugging the damn show now? No. <laughs> we want a pop a pop advert. I'll do a pop advert. <laughs> right, well, on that note, I think we'd better get out of here and uh, we'll come yeah. back with some hobby news. <laughs> Announcements, new releases, Kickstarters, what's caught our eye? It's time to catch up with the Meeples and Miniatures Hobby News. It's time for the news. What to you by Michael Trevor McDonald Hobbs? <laughs> <laughs> it's at that point you meant to actually come in with one of the headlines. Let's try oh. that again. Oh, bong. Sorry, bong. <laughs> no, Be- you don't say bong. I say bong. <laughs> you come in with. Right. Third time. Let's not edit this. Bong. Deep Cut Studios produce a very limited edition gaming mat. What's it look like? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was expecting the bong, bong, and we'll go back to it, different. Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it actually came out yesterday, and, right, okay, this is very, very limited edition, as in they're only doing 50. So it, it could even be, but by the time you listen to, uh, li- listen to this, they might have all gone. Okay, basically, they're celebrating Hubble Telescope's 26th birthday, uh, and they got permission from Hubble and the European Space uh, Agency to produce a mat of, of I actually think it was one of the first one of the first photos that Hubble took which is of the uh, of the bubble nebula uh, I mean I'm open to correction on on when that was produced but uh, it's a really famous photo of the uh, uh, of the bubble nebula uh, and they produced it as a 3 by 3 sci-fi gaming mat so ideal sort of thing for playing like you know X-wing or something it? they're producing it with a a neoprene backing so it's a, it's a uh, so it's their their heavy mouse mat material, which, funnily enough, we're going to do a video review of in some, sometime in the near future. Uh, but it's really, really good quality backing. Also comes with it. Uh, uh, actually, it comes with a case. Okay, uh, and it's going to be forty quid. But there's only fifty of them. It's actually a fairly new photo from the Hubble, I think. Oh, it's a bubble one for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if you could use it for X Wing though, because X Wing was set in the galaxy far, far away. What on the fact that what, what on the fact that this one is isn't that far away? Yeah. Depends on your definition of far. I suppose it's like, yeah, um, yeah, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's, that's maybe that's you know what's left of the um, Death Star. It's a nice looking map though. It's a nice looking map. Lovely, it's a lovely photograph. Oh, yeah. It is. It's very nice. Yes. So, friends of the show, Polyversal, well, actually not. It's actually Phalanx Consortium, who uh, um, listeners may remember, I interviewed Chris from Phalanx Consortium uh, at Historicon. I, 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 so, uh, I was going to say, didn't you speak to them, Chris? Yeah. I did indeed. And the um, very nice terrain that they were he was just demonstrating to me is now available as a Kickstarter, mm. the Neo Tyrannis Kickstarter. Yes. Yes, full details are including a link on the blog. But uh, yeah, they're, they're very nice. Uh, also, uh, I was expecting them to be. To be honest, the, the prototypes I saw were lovely, mm. and these these are really rather impressive. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing I was quite, also actually pretty impressed with is that considering the size of them, they're actually a fairly decent price as well. Yeah, uh, they're yeah, foam yeah. stuff, aren't they? Yeah, they're this, they're this interesting um, self-skinning foam Ooh. that makes them incredibly light. Literally, the big 15-inch um, tall tower block he showed me weighed less than 8 ounces. God. And they are super. They look really nice. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, with the fact that they're that light, I mean, uh, I mean, you saw them. How stable are they? Very. Well, they're, they're sensibly designed, so they won't fall over, which is part of it. They're not. They're not sort of sort of foam foam call blow away light. They're 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 quite rigid. They're very rigid, and they just they're just a nice sort of compromise between resin and and if you say somewhere about midway the point between resin and foam board, you've got about the idea of how light they are. Oh, cool. Mm. The the Kickstarter goals look very very nice. Oh. Very very reasonably priced. Nearly seven thousand dollars out of a nine fifteen thousand nine hundred dollar goal. Twenty six days to go, so I commend that one to you thoroughly. Yes. Not least because Chris is a nice bloke. Uh, I do like their tech center. The, the tech center, I, I, I particularly like. I think that's, uh, that's a very nice looking model. But yeah, as you say, it's, it's, it's one of those things of when you see most high tech board, uh, you know, most high tech sci fi boards, they look a particular way. And yet, uh, as I, said, I think I, I mentioned on the blog, yeah, you kind of look at when, when you do, if you Google kind of sci fi cityscape art, you know, it's all kind of these old uh, things like, you know, Blade Runner esque, um, yeah. uh, the problem you know, with skyscrapers most, and stuff like that. Yeah, most sci fi tables are significantly lacking in up. Yes. Yeah. And, and <clears> these, <throat> these, have, these have considerable amounts of up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of up in these things. There is. They, 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 as as uh, Chris said when I talked to him, if you've got games with flyers, they will not be flying over these buildings. They'll be flying round them. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they look very, very nice. And especially when you look at some of um, the mats that Cigar Box and Deep Cut are doing. You know, with the, the roads and stuff, you just all you need is that one of those mats. Drop on a few of those buildings, and that's your game board done. Yeah, yeah, very, uh, very, nice. absolutely. <clears throat> mm. Mm. All right. Um, if I know, only, what is um? If only I had a spare three hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm gonna no, um, a bit of gossip and news. Devil Pig, who uh, produced, uh, he was a nominee, which I like. Mm. Just announced that their their next Kickstarter, which is starting in September the twentieth, um, is going to be a company scale card game. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tactical card card game based in the Heroes of Normandy type universe, but it's company level, Ooh. which does look very interesting. So um, modular battle uh, battlegrounds, historical scenarios, easy to transport, playing time for thirty to forty five minutes for two players. So, um, not much other information on that, but it does sound interesting. Similar, similar, sort, similar sort of artwork to what they were using on Heroes of Normandy? Yeah, but they, um, it looks like each card will cover um, a company of individual stats, and the fact that it's a battleground it makes you presume that they're going to do something similar to what they've done with um, Heroes of Normandy, where you'll have an area of land and you'll be moving these cards around, I'm guessing, but we don't know much yet. So that sounds interesting. Ooh. More of that when we find it. Indeed. Right. Another couple of Kickstarters while we're on it. First off, interesting one. Uh, well, I, I, I was I, I decided I was t- going to try and do a, a bit of a Kickstarter roundup on the blog and found a couple, uh, two or three that were quite interesting. Um, one we one uh, as has uh, now just completed, uh, so which was the sci-fi terrain one, that was um, Space Foundation. Uh, but two interesting ones. First off, halfling skeleton archers. Who doesn't want them? Who, who doesn't want? Who doesn't want a set of halfling skeleton archers? Scotty ha- Boyd. Have you seen Bob Ollie? Bob Ollie, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the one and only Bob Ollie. Yes. Have you seen the skeleton chicken? <laughs> Actually, I, I heard people going about going on about the chicken. I must have missed the chicken. 
as far as you know, things that obviously on on, every, on everybody's wish list, uh, I'm sure halfling skeletons were were somewhere near the top. These look great, really look good. Massively impressed. That's finishing on the twenty for the twentieth December, twentieth of September, and uh, yeah, that is that is currently just over five hundred percent funded. So yeah, that's yeah, that's definitely happening. Good stuff. Um, Fire Dragon Games stone textured foam sheets. Now this is if you're of the persuasion to go and mark your. Um, foam sheet, 10 mil foam sheets with biro, you can draw your own walls on them. If you'd rather pay someone else to do it, um, Fire Dragon Dames games are doing 280 mil by 10 square by 10 mil sheets of the magic blue foam stamped on both sides with stone block textures in 28 mil. Yours for five sheets for 15 quid, 10 sheets for 27 quid, 20 sheets for 49 quid, 1500 quid goal already well past it, 11 days to go. Lovely job. Next. Yes, well, uh, I'd say, uh, other than that, they, uh, they also, uh, now, they, they already do, uh, some, uh, s- several bits of, you know, resin accessories, doors, uh, torches, that sort of thing. Ideal for building scenery for a certain popular cold skirmish game, for example, or if you uh, want to. No, 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 or if you wanted a dungeon sergeant, sergeant dungeon, or, uh, um, some walls for your Kona maps, or, Anything like that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, apparently, and, and you don't happen to have a three D printer. Indeed, apparently, this is the, f- uh, the this is funding the first of uh, what they hope to be quite a few different uh, dies that they're um, uh, yeah that they wanted to put together for doing this sort of thing. So they, uh, so they hope they're actually hoping to produce several different types Could, because you can already already buy just the plain styrene sheets from them. Okay, if if uh, you, you go to buy those games. From, from any other uh, well, any yeah. number of people actually, yes. Um, but, but as I say, they're, they're, uh, the the Kickstarter is to actually by the press, so they can so, so they can start producing this sort of thing. Yeah, and and to be fair, it's something you can do with with a, a scriber of some sort and a ruler, but they've got little extra little wrinkles in the texture that just make it look that little bit better than just having sat there and taken a piece of foam board and a pen. Yes. Very nice. Very yes. nice. Oh, good. But I think the biggest news we've had uh, over the last few weeks is um, one that's probably going to be close to your heart, Mike, is Kings of War Historical. I have to say, I'm awaiting that with a certain measure of interest. Hmm. Yeah, so what we know is the book will have the core Kings of War rules, this for historical armies from antiquity to the late Middle Ages. 30, 30 army lists in the book, I think, that they say something like that. Mm. Yeah. And also the ability to, to add mythical units to recreate legends or make new ones. In other words, turning it into a fantasy game. Yeah, well, I, you know. I, Hang on a minute. <laughs> 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 and the circle is complete. <laughs> It'll never catch on. <laughs> no. Yeah. Ah, to be fair, um, the rules are, if you want a fast play, mass combat... Sword, spears, etc. Battle system. There are much, much worse than Kings of War. It's not going to please the historical purist, I suspect, but it's going to be no worse than WAB. In fact, probably a damn sight better because it's not going to have stupid skirmishes in it in the way that people abuse the skirmishes in WAB. Not that I'm bitter or anything. It doesn't sound like you are at all. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how it comes out. You know. It, it could be like another WAB clone, where you. Problem with WAB is it's, you always had your, your sort of champions, didn't you? Which sort of so many. It's sort of, going to have the same problem WAB has, unless you are the kind of person who organises your um, campaign. In that you're going to get um, uh, people fighting Vikings against ancient Egyptians and so on. And, yeah, you know, it's one of the things that Wab and Army of Antiquity caused to happen, and they weren't always balanced. And But it's it's a nice... I've, I've, having, I've played enough Kings of War. It's a nice set of rules. It's very easy to learn. I played a game on Monday night without actually bothering to look at the rule book at all. And mm. I had fun. And if you want a fun little mass combat game to use those ancient armies that you put away because nobody plays Wab anymore, go for it. Yeah, it, it does sound, you know... A logical. But while you've got those armies out, don't forget Gripping Beast have got something coming out soon. Yes. 
yes. written by Marty Gibbons, who wrote Web 2. Yes, we can find out all about that in, in, in a few weeks, can't we? Yeah, we are, yes. Um, mm. If we don't wind up discussing all the available fans, um, sci-fi... Blah, 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 historical rule sets sometime in January, which I think we were threading on Twitter. Well, it'd be good, you know, because there's there seems to be two different classes of ancient rule sets out there. There's the, the sort of web clones where you have individual base figures set into units with, you know, with commanders and so forth. And then you've got the impetus style where you have a, a unit is a single base. And for me, I prefer the latter. I prefer the single base thing, but I know there's a lot of people who like the, the single base figure set into different size units. So yeah, you know, a, it is, it is what it is. Yeah. It'll, it'll appeal to some folks. It won't appeal to others. If everybody liked everything, we'd have a really boring hobby. Indeed. But I think this will go quite well. And I've, I've heard good things about Kings of War. So yeah. Mm. I I'm, like it. Some people don't. Mm. I'm looking, well, I'm at the very least looking forward to see what they're going to do with it. And, ha- yeah. and, uh, yeah, I suppose, yeah, it's about time I got, I got a game of Kings of War. So I'll have well, to pop over to Peter c- and get c- some considering. Work. Considering that my kingdom of men army is likely formed of Romans, Normans, and Parthians, I can hardly talk. Mm. Sounds like you're pretty much set up, ready for, for this is all I'm, I'm good. I've got I've got loads of forces that will sit on on kings of war size movement trays and and very quickly turn into nice forces to play kings of war historical for, with. So I'm happy. Mm. Cool. Moving on. I think that's about it, isn't it, for the news? Anything else? That's about it. I think. Yeah, that's, I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, a record, uh, almost a record time for the news this time uh, So, uh, we'll take a quick break. And oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. You, I can't believe that you two have not commented on Command & Colours' epic Napoleonics. Oh, yeah. Command & Colours has been reprinted. <laughs> yeah, it's September. Yep. Yeah, yeah, hang on, isn't that another game you're buying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was really wasn't it? You kind of went, oh, it's a P, it's a P, it's a P five hundred. I'll, I'll order it because it'll be ages. Yeah, and it appeared in like two weeks because <laughs> absolutely everybody's been waiting for it to be reprinted. Sure. <laughs> and, and there's also one or two new ways of playing bigger games of Command and Colors Napoleonic. That should appeal to you a lot. Yes, they're bringing out expansion number six. Would you believe, uh, which is epic? Um, was that was that uh, faint, despairing cry I heard? Hobbsy's wallet again. No, because you just have to buy another, another, another box set. Yeah, I, I mean, number six is. Uh, I, I mean, act, I, I mean, to be fair, epic games of C and C are are not everybody's cup of tea. No, um, they're multiplayer, aren't they? Uh, well, actually, what they're doing this time around is that they're doing two different versions. They got Le Grand Battle or whatever, which actually is multiplayer, but they're actually but, but the epic one is now. Um, uh, they're actually doing it so they, uh, they're basically just making the board big enough but still having it so you can still play with two players okay that'd be good so yeah so, so, so when we say two different ways of playing it one is actually still aimed at a two play uh, it could either be a two or a four player game the big one is still an, an, an eight player game essentially with the, the epic one you normally get the second board in there don't you you do yeah but uh, uh, they are producing I think they're putting two boards in there because they are actually changing the size of the board they're making Ooh. it sort of like 20 by 11, I think, and then you can put two together. So it's going to be huge, huge. So yes, that's uh, apparently... Uh, so the reprint's coming out in September, and Epic is due out uh, la- later half of October, I believe. Mm. But I'm fed up with June 2, because they still haven't... I'm still, wait- I'm still waiting for my Android version of Twilight Struggle. It's at least a year late. Everybody else has got theirs. PC's got theirs. iOS has got theirs. Poor old Android. Oh, in there. Can you just play it on your laptop? Oh. Why would incidentally. I, why, would I want to put, why would I want to have to buy it again on my laptop when I do a Kickstarter pledge for um, when I do a Kickstarter pledge for my Android version? And ah, plus, the fact, okay. plus the fact I didn't have to buy uh, uh, or I thought, uh, 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 I have to get a decent laptop. <laughs> Oh, uh, and and just as a, as a complete aside, but related, just to wrap up the news, I have noted that Battle Lord Command is actually available on the Mac from Steam as well. Click. Yeah, it's very good, Mike. Boy, it's worth it. It's it's yeah. it's really okay. good fun. Online online multiplayer. Talk to you later, Hobbsy. <laughs> 
I have the Android version, yes. Online multiplayer, I think actually that is potentially we can actually all get a game together. That would be um, there, that probably that probably means that we'll end up doing that and then not recording a podcast. <laughs> or finding that we, likely. Or finding that record it while we're playing. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of swearing at each other. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's get. Okay, so I think I th- oh, for those commenting on those moments where people buy stuff while talking about it, click, click. <laughs> yes, it's getting worse. It indeed. Okay, so uh, on on that note, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll be chatting with Robin Fitton uh, all about Imperial Skies. Have you ever wondered what's going on in Wargaming? We do too. So come with us as we go Behind the Hobby with the Meeples and Miniatures interview. We'd like to welcome back to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast, because he's been here before. It's, uh, well, probably more well-known for the, uh, as the author of Grunts, but he's he's here with a, a brand new game. It's Robin Fitton. Hello, Robin. Hello. Hello, and thanks for having me back again. It's great to, it's great to have you. How are you, mate? You well? I'm doing well, thanks. Yes, yeah. Very busy year with changes in jobs and things and getting these, uh, these rules out the door as well. But, uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it at the moment. Cool. And... And of course, it's so close to actually getting the rules out, so it must be a very exciting time for you. Well, it is, yes. Well, interesting enough, I did a Kickstarter update today uh, saying that the rule, uh, the books were on the way to me. I came home and they were all on the doorstep, you know, oh, six super. big boxes of books. So I just did my back in, carrying them in, um, <laughs> and then had that moment where I thought, oh, my wife, she's going to she's gonna moan wherever I put these. Um, but uh I managed to find somewhere just out of the way to sort of stack them all up. Yeah, so they've arrived. All right, so it's the usual, it's the usual thing. All, all of a sudden, you've got all these books piled up in front of the telly. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> we can't say. I've made, a, yeah, I've made some War Games train out of them, uh, out of the boxes. But, yeah, they're, they're, there's a big old stack, and it was one of those moments where I saw them on the doorstep. I thought, have I ordered twice as much as I needed or something? <laughs> Didn't realise they, they, they'd be so substantial. But, yeah, they're all here. Crack them open to see that they hadn't, you know, all printed blank or something daft like that. But they're yeah, they're here and they're and they're looking good. So, you know, what's good about that is I can I can start to get those shipped out with um, with Tony Francis from Brigade Models soon as well. So uh, and fulfil the Kickstarter, cool. which will be great. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting mine. Oh, good stuff. Of course, Neil Neil's got one already. Uh, yeah, I che- yeah, I, yeah, well, I cheated. Will be very kindly sent me one. Thank you, sir. Only review copies. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, I think I did get a bit of hate mail when I, uh, I tweeted earlier in the week and went, uh, oh, look at your interview oh, yeah. later in the week. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Went, How come you've got one? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, well, yes, yeah, that's uh, it's one of those things. But I, I have been careful on that because, you know, you, you do hear about Kickstarters, don't you, where people, um, um, you know, even big companies, they, they start selling them um, on their shops or at shows before they've even shipped them out. So... Yeah, I've tried, tried to avoid doing that anyway, but just the old review copy has sort of slipped out, so, yeah. So, of course, we're talking about Imperial Skies, uh, which is a so brand new game for yourself. Um, something a bit different from 15 mil sci-fi. It is, yeah. It, it's still quite niche, though, I suppose, isn't it? As in 15 mil sci-fi has been sort of gaining in profile, hasn't it, over the last six or so years from I, I say, different I, people? I, yeah, I, I, I was going to say that 15 mil sci-fi is, is is getting to be one of those kind of, you know, it, it's, it's it's a fairly kind of well-known scale and genre. You know, lots of people, there's a lot of people that do 15 mil sci-fi, hasn't it? Yeah, it's quite accessible, isn't it? Yeah. So, um uh, to just buy a few figures and, and start the start gaming with them, I think uh, initially many years ago it was quite attractive because attractive people thought it was a bit cheaper to buy a few figures. But now you've got such a, a broad range of anything, you know, any vehicle you could want, any troop type. It um, makes it an interesting proposition because you pretty much make whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm. so, so what what attracted you to um, Aeronorths? <laughs> Yeah, 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 well, yeah, yeah, we're all flying battleships. What gives? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's switch back to that one. So, yeah. yeah, I've been playing it actually and had a, 
a small fleet from Brigade Models, the uh, the guys in the UK that produce all the miniatures for it, for a very long time. And in fact, um, I used to go to I say, what was it called? Ragnarok, I think it was in Birmingham. It was, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, these... part of the SFSFW um, science fiction and fantasy wargaming yes. group. They used yeah. to have a show. Yeah, and I saw it down there many, many years ago. And yeah, I enjoyed it then. Something about the the naval aspects. And, you know, I was into that sort of it's sort of UK scene, I guess you could call it, couldn't you, where um and it's been around for quite a long time of independent games like Ground Zero games with full thrust and and brigade models. They've been around for a long time and they, they produce some good quality miniatures and it, it's it's fun to get into a bit different, bit less than a bit different from the mainstream of uh, you know your games workshops and, and and the typical approach to gaming. So yeah, that's what got me hooked. And obviously, I like the naval aspects and I like the full thrust side of things in terms of you know having a fleet that can slowly get its damage ground down over time, um, so you can have quite a relaxed pace of game and sort of build up. Um, so yeah, liked all those aspects and the kind of victorian sci-fi period as well as that sort of just general steampunk side of things and then finally the other bit is i'd been doing a lot of reading on world war one and um that's why this is actually set i've got it down as the cover has july 1919 but the history in there uh, starts from um sort of the 19th century and then over into the start of world war one and I'd been reading about the period, so I thought of, it just felt right. I've got lots of books and biplanes and um, various bits and pieces from the period, and I, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if a setting around World War One would see the the battle take to the skies, really, rather than continuing down, bogged down in the trenches? So uh, the invention of lighter than aircraft in that period is kind of the 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 crux of the the background and um, various nations starting battles in the air uh, because it's more effective than continuing in the trenches. Mm. So in the little history that's in there, it doesn't, uh, World War One doesn't end, it, it, and it kind of just continues with a battle in the air with piracy and all the kind of high seas type things that happened the century before but happening in the sky. So, yeah, that, that, that's generally where I was with it and wanted to make that into a set of rules. So, yeah, spoke to Tony at Brigade Models as well in terms of starting it all up because I didn't want to start a new rule set because there already was, as you mentioned, there's Air and F already there. That's that's an existing game um, by Steve Blees, a very good game and obviously an inspiration for this as well. Yeah, I checked with Tony first to see if it was OK because I had lots of ideas I wanted to make into a rule set. And then three years later, <laughs> got it got it finally done. So there you go. Yeah, because Air and F itself is um well, if I'm, it's it's actually out of print now isn't it the i rules. think so i think you can buy um i think you can buy the pdf version on war games vault um yeah. there's a couple of modules that go with it as well yeah i think you can still do that i'm not sure if tony at brigade you know he it, at shows over the years he was he, people would ask and i think you'd have the occasional copy left over but yes i think it's officially sort of out of print but you know, there's no saying it won't it won't come back again. It could it could well do as well. Well, well what what I, actually I was wondering is that it is mm. in some ways is Imperial Skies almost like Air and F Second Edition, or is it completely removed from it? Because I must admit, I've never played the original mm-hmm. Air and F. Well, it's I mean, it's using the same miniature line from Brigade. But I didn't. I didn't look at the rules and decide to just to make tweaks and improvements. I, I sort of started taking in everything i play you know everything from my there's the command points in here that sort of was inspired by the sort of older dba dbm rules where you roll a d6 for your command pips every turn there's obviously influences from full thrusts gunnery type uh, things in there as well so i kind of brought together lots of different ideas for what i think would make a good game uh, rather than particularly picking on uh, air and f and saying well i could really improve that one thing or this thing i, I just went went at it from scratch really yeah because full first you know, can be a bit book heavy especially when you've got quite a few ships on the go was your idea to try and make a simpler game that you could you where you could play bigger fleets that was the idea yes i wanted to make sure it stayed uh, sort of a simple game i'd been um 
Uh, we have an a annual event, sometimes twice a year as well, at a place called Stoke Rochford Hall, which is up near Nottingham. And uh, there's a lot of Victorian sci-fi players. We, we come together. It's not a big group. And we played uh, Air and F there. And a lot of people liked the idea, you know, you get around a table and sometimes we had 100 ships on the board. So, you know, the, the idea was to continue that sort of theme and make it quite easy to get a big game in if you wanted that sort of size without lots and lots of tiny fine details but i did certainly have added more detail in there to reflect slightly different profiles on ships and things like that so you know your japanese ships might have got sort of shorter range more effectiveness plus rockets and uh or torpedoes so there's things like that that just differentiate some of the fleets a bit as well yeah, because the standard fleet is about what, seven ships, six, seven ships. Yes, yeah. For a small for a small starter, you could get away. Um, well, generally, what we play is sort of between uh, ten and fifteen ships aside for for a game that's going to run for an hour and a half to two hours. But yes, if you could you could certainly have a good sized game if you had sort of twenty ships per side. Mm. Um, and again, it depends how you um, profile the ships. There's a tendency, and I think it's in uh, in all of us, to sort of max out. And that's quite often what was happening at these big events that we were doing up at Stoke Rochford Hall, where we'd get to the table and, and have a look over the other side, and they'd have sort of 20 battleships lined up on you, rather than sort of mixing the fleet of it. So, you know, my, my uh, big piece is that I, I quite enjoy even the smaller ships in the game, because you can get an interesting an interesting story and play going and interplay going between the different ships rather than just going for the big stuff because that does obviously slow things down as you have to grind down their um, bigger armor hull plating and things that so takes a bit longer for the game to, to pan out yeah yeah and i can see that and i suppose it's it's the thing in naval combat as a whole you know you can have all of these great big battleships and dreadnoughts floating around but usually it's a smaller lighter um, destroyers who can get in there who are a lot more nimble and you know, chuck a torpedo in and that's you know one big battleship going crippled which is that's, that's why, true yes yeah <laughs> which is why Jericho tuned away at the, <laughs> at the Jetland wasn't it that's right I mean naval battles are one of those things really aren't they that history has many big events where just that one shell got into the got into the weapon side of things or the storage or some fire started somewhere um and caused a big explosion so yeah it's one of those things i haven't necessarily got uh, that quick death approach to the rules but there is a method if you roll three sixes because there's exploding dice in this every time you roll a six for damage you'd roll it again uh, to do another point of damage if you roll three in a row you get a sort of a bigger explosion effect um, so there's that chance, a uh, small chance of causing quite a big catastrophic amount of damage on a big vessel. But it's, um, you know, it's a slim enough chance when we worked it through probability wise to to not make it something that's going to be like a game killer where you think, oh, I've lost my big ship in the first 10 minutes sort of thing. Yeah. You linked it very early on with, with game models. How open was he to actually work with, with you to, to to do the rules? Was he fully engaged or... Yeah, really. Yeah, Tony's very supportive, and obviously, then we'd um, we'd spoken about it many times. And I'm sure it's one of those things. Quite often, as well, that um, as a miniatures company, you might have people approach you and say, "Oh, I've got, I've got this idea for a game, and it would be great with your figures." And then nothing ever happens, you know. So, you know that sometimes there's probably that little bit of doubt whether something is, is actually ever going to come out. And yes, it did take me three years from when I first thought i had it nearly done <laughs> to, to finishing it so you know grunts 15 mil took me four years uh, and this took me three years so i think i'm doing well in terms of improving uh, speed to market so to speak but um yeah he was open uh, and then eventually uh, we went to a couple of shows together i went to antwerp uh, crisis in antwerp last year with him to do a demo game um and then uh that was when the Kickstarter went live after that, and he was obviously very supportive in that we did the Kickstarter together. So there were orders for miniatures that went in, in Tony's direction, and I got the orders for the rules. So, yeah, that worked out well because he reduced the overall prices as well of the models. So that's one good advantage of working with an existing miniatures company is that you can you can bundle the rules um, 
and um, and obviously get get something out that's an incentive for people to back the uh, the rule book as well when they're uh, getting a cheaper deal on the miniatures. You mentioned that it, 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 it kind of took you three years to get to the point where you were about ready to go to market, um, um, and then you went down the Kickstarter route. How was that for you? Well, it was it was quite good. It's more work than you think. I always think, oh, I'm just going to click a button and be done with it. But it's actually it's quite a lot to deal with um, on your own, especially because I was doing it on my own. You know, I didn't put any of that on Tony in terms of brigade in terms of setting things up. That was all my own work. Um, but I'd, I'd done it before with grunts, uh, but only in a really small sort of unknown way. In that, I think it was four year, four maybe four or five years. Oh, it must be four years. Um, I did an Indiegogo, which is the UK version oh, of Kickstarter for grunts, but uh, bet no one knew me back then, and um, it was very small, but I, I made a reasonable amount on there to just get things rolling. But at that time, again, I was at that last sort of 10% of the rules on grunts, and the Indiegogo gave me that incentive to... I had to get it done, because I had... I think I had like 100... Around, between 70 and 100 backers... Yeah. And really, you kind of then thinking, well, I have to get this done. I owe it to these people. They've they've pledged money now, um, and I need to get it done. And you know, being you know relatively professional sort of person with the career, I you know I like to make sure things things get finished. Although it's it is really hard. The last ten percent of your rules will take you know four times longer than the rest did. I don't know how that works out, but um, just finishing things gets uh, quite quite difficult. But back to the Kickstarter, yes, um, it takes some time to set it up. It's you need to take time to sort of make things look attractive as well. And you know, I, I did some. I, I know how to use Photoshop and a few things like that, so I was able to lay things out quite neatly um, in terms of the add-ons. So it's worth doing that so that you're not just like listing text with add-ons. You need like a picture of what people get. People definitely like that. Also painted. Uh, models it's always worth having painted models to to get people interested and then set it running i must admit i don't do a lot of um promotion i'm pretty i I rely on the fact i've got a bit of a network that's established already i don't go like for example i didn't go on to maybe tony did at brigade put something on the temp site possibly miniatures page but i don't go out there and spend a lot of time in fact i just didn't have the time to go and you know, I could have been going into forums. In fact, I did it with Grunts, though, back in the day. I did that, went everywhere I possibly could, even on related forums. You know, if it was a Battletech forum, I went on there, spoke about Grunts there as well, just to get as many people aware of it as possible. You know, you only need one or two keen people to, to be enthusiastic about it, and they'll start sharing the, the message, really. Word of mouth is always the, the, the best way. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's ahead. I mean, like the thing I've always liked about Grunt and also what you've been doing with Imperial Skies is the painting mm-hmm. guides and the work you put into, you know, this is how you can paint stuff. This is how, you hear some techniques and YouTube videos that you put together. Yeah, it's just really, really good. Yeah, thanks for that. Yes, I mean, that's why I definitely try and do that. I mean, I'm just looking now through the book and I can see, yeah, the painting guide starts on nine, page 92 um, and it goes through to sort of page 117 so it took an awful long 26 time 26 pages 26 pages of painter guide and that was meant to be about With... 10, it was meant to be 10 pages and every extra page i did and then i then said to myself oh actually i should do a page on priming and then i went i should really do a page on on cleaning the models up you know and when i i didn't plan that very well actually and it probably extended my kickstarter by about three months really in total You've got, six, you got six and a half to use an airbrush. <laughs> I've got a half to use an airbrush. It's very light on airbrush, oh, yeah, but, but yeah. <laughs> um, coming back to the man, uh, Kickstarter idea, if people are doing their own uh, books, I also wrote to um, Army Painter because, uh, you know, and I didn't realise they're in Denmark because I've been on holiday in Denmark the year before, but they're own Army Painter from Denmark and they gave me a, a, a set of paints uh, on the basis that I said I'd use all of their paints for the guide, so that you know those kind of things help if you're a sort of budding uh, developer of a set of rules. You know, it, uh, ask around, um, and I've done the same actually because I'm working now on a set of rules called Tommy's that are still early, early, early days. But I wrote to uh, and spoke to Peter Pig because obviously they do the 15 mil 
uh, World War One models that, that I'm keen on. And they said they'd support the process. Obviously, I haven't got any, uh, I've not got any freebies or anything, but it, it was a case of just knowing that someone else is out there. They'd say, oh, yeah, we take an interest in that and the possibility then, if I then create something more substantial, that um, I might get a you know a joint Kickstarter or something down the line. But obviously, that's still still early days on that yeah. one. And plus, the fact it also means that you you immediately means yeah you've got permission to use yes yeah, to use their models in, in that's the it all that sort of thing, yeah. yeah that's it. I always ask. I don't like to get started on these without having approval. Mm-hmm. And on grunts, that was really hard. I had to keep knocking on doors. Critical mass games were one. And I think it was probably rude of me, actually, but I was sort of saying, oh, I want to get you in my rules. And they were at a point where they just started their 15 mil sci-fi line and they were trying to get rules out and they weren't interested to start with. And it was, oh, actually, no, we don't. It will confuse our customers because they wanted to create, you know, in the same way that you maybe you had your um, your battlefront type uh, rule sets. They wanted that sort of way where people would buy them the rules and buy the miniatures at the same time. But yeah. in the end, I ground them down and they came round to letting me put some models in the rules and, and use them. So, uh, you know, that's really, really helpful to, to get involved with the other manufacturers. So, so you made about twice your original goal, yeah? What was that, on the, on the funding? Yeah. How much how, did you expect that, or was that was that a surprise? Um, how, how, how I much? wanted loads more because every time <laughs> I look, I keep seeing these these kickstarters for sometimes something that you know it might be a small light board game or something, and I'll look at it and I go, that looks quite simple. The artwork's quite basic, and they'll get you know thirty forty thousand dollars, and I think what's what are they doing? Mm-hmm. Right, that my massive amount of creative energy and years and years of development <laughs> don't get me anything near so, that. so were, there, were those stretch goals all, all planned from the start yes yeah they had i did put them in there and it was one of those things where i realized just based them on what the brigade model pieces were right. and also i wanted to make sure those rulers and dice and things were in there as well and that's where tony helped me on the dice actually because he knew someone uh, tony from brigade he knew someone that uh, a company that would make the dice so we, we i went down that route with him to get custom dice made up as well mm-hmm. so so yeah put all the stretch goals in got them in there and was surprised actually the amount of fleets that people bought um so a big shocker actually i thought that people would buy a, a set of rules and they'd add on one small fleet but i had some pretty big orders and that's what took the number up and I haven't got the number in front. I can't actually remember what it exactly was, but seven thousand two hundred and seven pounds. Yeah, well, that's my um, job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I can, I'm the one who looks at people's kickstarters. You, you look at the kickstarters, but yes. So yeah, that was quite reasonable. Although I'd say majority is is miniatures uh, on that. So you know, Tony, uh, he's Tony's obviously discounted them, but. Um, I think we did better on miniatures and models than we when we did on the rule set. But one thing to do, which we really were keen on, that's what Tony was keen on as well. No one could buy the miniatures if they didn't get the book as well. So um, that was a big key thing. Actually, yeah. Tony suggested you, you only that had the two me. pledges, didn't you? That was right. And Tony, Tony suggested that, and, um, and I hadn't thought about that before because I, I had the ideas of doing a PDF and then a copy of the rules, um, but to to avoid any confusion where people just came on and used it as a way to get cheap miniatures um, from Brigade, we did it so, you know, you had to have the book first and then you could add on to the book as well. And I think that's quite quite a reasonable way of doing it. Of course, you could have been in the position where you didn't actually get enough money to actually produce the book because everyone just put all, you know, put all the money into buying the miniatures. Yeah. And that might be, you know, 50 people who weren't actually be on the book and you're then stuck yes, having yeah. to produce it. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's what it's one of those cases where the one pound so you can so you can pay for any of the add-ons is actually a really mm. bad idea. Yeah. Yes, and I, somehow I didn't have one of those pledges, but I still got you know about twenty or so people did put like a dollar on on there, but I don't think they were expecting to get into the pledge manager. It was just a case of they were you know you can do that kind of tip type thing. So there were a few people did that. But yeah, generally speaking, most obviously most people got the rules and then and the add-ons from there. The other thing to remember when you're doing this, and I see it all the time, is it's if I wasn't working and this was my li- total hundred percent living, I'd have the time to handle it. But if with with lots of different pledge options, suddenly when you get to the fulfilment point and you're trying to ship them out, 
and you're trying to work out what people want, it's it's going to make your job much, much harder to have lots of very different mm-hmm. options because you've got spreadsheets in front of you with lots of names and mm-hmm. they want two of this but only one of those and and it, it, it does make the job a lot harder. So keeping it simple if you're, if you're starting out and you're doing a set of rules or mm-hmm. Uh, you know, limited miniatures lines. Don't don't overstretch yourself. I think's the. Yeah, I noticed thing. that you did ships to anywhere in the world. You didn't yes. get any nasty surprises with that one, then. We got a nasty surprise in that um, um, about twenty percent, really, overall um, of what of the money made profit in there mm. uh, was wiped out with Brexit because um, all the awesome. all of the um, yeah all of the uh, shipping I had to do in the US uh, not shipping from the UK but all the shipping that that's coming from the US uh, obviously all got hit by that um, and all the cost of printing the books went up by twenty percent as well so yeah I did lose out on that um, well folks uh, we, we had a question from uh, we had a question in the last show saying how has Brexit affected um, affected the uh, the UK well there you go straight away so there's your answer. On the counter side to this, though, to, I, I, you know, I know that I you know, spoke to a few miniatures companies and they're doing very well. They've had a flurry of orders because obviously with the, the dollar yeah. going up and the euro going up, there, there has been more more exports because their their money's uh, obviously doing better against the pound and they can they feel like they're getting a better deal. So I think it's working for some areas. Mm. And for me, um, long, much longer term, when this uh, goes for sale on the... Uh, if War Games Vault as a print on demand, it's all kind of managed from War Games Vault, which is in America as well. So if someone buys a, a rule book for fifteen dollars, obviously when I convert that back to sterling, I'm doing a little bit better out of it in in the in the reverse. <laughs> so hopefully over the course of a couple of years, I'll claw back the sort of loss that came through from from Brexit well, hitting us. With the Kickstarter, did you just? get the, the the rules printed that you needed or did you do a a, a bigger print run so slightly you get it slightly bigger but not massively bigger because again i think we mentioned before it's quite a niche isn't it that sort of attracted to me uh, attracted me to it in that it's a different kind of period i've no idea how well it will sell and i mean grunts was the same really i've never sold a huge amount I mean, i've never had someone come up to me and said oh i need 500 copies to distribute in america or something it's always drips and drabs of the odd book here and there you know john at gzg might want 20 copies for shows um you know i get a few copy orders in like that but not not a great deal so i'm not expecting much more than that on this um it's one of those things because i think it's more niche than 15 mil sci-fi is at the moment but at the same time it's quite well established so hopefully um, you know, some followers of those that range of miniatures will take interest, and also I think uh, production-wise, I've slightly ramped up my quality uh, from the grunts uh, in terms of its better quality paper. Um, so the cost of it's higher. It's my layout slightly cleaner than before. So yeah, I've done, and also I've got all the stats in there, and that's a piece I wanted to mention actually. Because I was going to ask you because uh, yeah. yeah, there is. It's at least a quarter of the. It's at least a quarter of the book is taken up with stats cards, and stats That's cards, right. and so, more stats cards, <laughs> and more stats cards. Yeah. So I had, I had a lot of feedback from um, players in the past with grunts at shows where they people people that wanted the easy to play. I just need my cards all ready to go. Um, and grunts, of course, I didn't really put any profiles in there apart from sample ones. Um, so, so yeah, I took that on board and I put all of the cards in there uh, in one hit. Uh, what I'm also going to do from from this is that the buyers of the book will get a PDF access so they can print those cards as well. Um, and I'm also working on having them made into cards for uh, print-on-demand cards as well. So you'll be able to go, I want a German fleet. Um, and uh, choose a printout of that from the War Games Vault, and they'll send you a pack of cards with the stats on there already. So that's the other other thing I want to do, and that's why they're in that card format in there because it was easier for me to just do it in that one in that one hit. And also, it's quite visual as well. You know, you can go go and go to the Russian page and have a browse, and I, I think it's just a little bit easier than reading just a flat table in front of you. So, uh, yeah. So that's that's where that came well, from. So, so you, you're doing a good job preempting my questions here, Bobby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think you've answered. Uh, we had a couple of questions from listeners uh, who who were asking a couple of things. Uh, you kind of covered 
uh, a lot of what uh, Mr. Uh, O'Hara, who is uh, uh, at the last brunch on Twitter, uh, he was asking uh, basically if you'd already b- heavily bought into the figures, was Imperial Skies compatible in this, in, in, in versions of, in in terms of scale and stuff, and do you need new figures? Uh, it sounds like basically if you've got the existing game models, then not a problem at all, yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah, it's all it's all built around those. All the play testing has been made with their their models, and yeah. So yeah, and also I tried. I think I may have like missed one or two minor ships, but I got from Tony the full list um, of every ship from every faction, and I've put them all in there. So so they're all in there. Whatever ship you buy at the moment, has got a card already and a stat profile for it. Um, so yeah, it's okay. to and, and so the, the question was, which I think you've, uh, I, I think you kind of answered. So, so once the initial print run has gone, you'll be uh, distributing this via Wargames Vault. Uh, Actually, no, no, no. Uh, I will be eventually, but I've agreed with Tony that he can sell it from from his web store. Um, so he's bought some additional oh, cool. copies as an initial batch. Uh, so we're going normal, sort of. Um, normal sales route at the moment with it um so you'd need to go on the brigade site and and add it to basket there and order it or pick it up at a show so we're doing that initially and see how it goes so um, so, so will totally so, then be carrying uh, uh, the accessories like the range rollers and the flights that's the idea that yes Yep, yeah, uh, he will we'll get all those laser cut and he'll take a, a stock of those as well. I've got a big box of them to take over for the Kickstarter plus some extras as well. So, so yeah, that's the idea so that uh, you'll be able to sort of buy those accessories at the same cool. time. And now, once that so once that stock has run out, at that point, I uh, you're then going to go to print on demand, maybe. No, we'll keep we we'll keep we'll see how it plays out. If it takes him six months to sell it, I'll, I'll start crying. And um, and then probably just put it on the kick on on the uh, War Games Vault for to make it a globally available set of rules, uh, which it will be anyway from Tony, obviously. But uh, but if it does move quite quickly, then we'll he'll probably be in touch to to reorder. So yeah, and, and I imagine there might be, you know, with us with all these things, there'll be hopefully a bit of a flurry to start with, um, and uh, and then it will settle in. So we'll see see how it goes. I mean. The reason I'm asking this as well is, is that somebody's asking is that will it be available as a PDF? Yeah, I think I will do that. And again, I'll again I'll just get through this original run and see how it goes from there. And then I'll and then I'll probably do the same as Grunts, where I sell it as a PDF or the book or a combined bundle of the two as well. So yeah, yeah, it's all digitally done. So you know, some uh, uh, back in the old days, it used to be that people would uh, produce a set of rules, and then to actually make it PDF would be another big yeah. chore, you know, because they, they, it was all ready for print rather than PDF. But this is now, this could be PDF tomorrow if I wanted it to be. So yeah, I'm ready, ready for that. So I just want to make sure, uh, we, you know, we start things rolling with the print copy before I uh, switch on the PDFs. Now, as, as part of the rules, uh, as well as producing stats for most if not all of the existing uh, model range uh, you've also included rules for designing your own craft room. I have yeah they're very simple they won't pass any mathematical scrutiny but they're, they're in there uh, in a basic way to allow people to, to um, build out uh, their own stats so Yes, um, and they are based on how I've put the points together for the rest of the uh, the ships in there as well, which all have their points uh, factors on them as well. So, yeah, you can make them up. And the other thing is, uh, interestingly enough, we, I've, every game I've played uh, of uh, Air and F in the past, no one was ever really worried about points. So it wasn't a big factor in the rules. Because I know a lot of people, there's swings and roundabouts, isn't there? Some people say they like point systems, some don't. Uh, so this wasn't really intended as a competitive thing, but I just wanted a nice loose way where you could go, well, actually, I want to make something a bit unusual, and you can do that. So, yeah, you can do your own builds, um, and it's broken down by all the different types of weapons, your speed, the size of the hull, uh, and various other factors are on there as well. But, yeah, it's it's quite light, but hopefully it's light but still concise as well. So, yeah. That's yeah, it's in there if they need it. One thing that's missing from the rules, um, which will be a PDF as well, is some blank cards so you can make your own, uh, you know, scribble in the uh, 
you know the factors for the cannons and things on your own cards based on using the uh, stat builder as well uh, that will go up on the brigade model site as, as along with along with the uh, profiles for the actual pre-made ships as well yeah and and there's also, there's also on the brigade so there's already a pdf of the range also of the turn templates isn't it? yes yeah i didn't want to make it inaccessible but you know for those people that know the x-wing game that has the turn rulers they're like that but they're uh, they're laser cut versions um and there's more of the they're just curve light gentle curves ranging from the bigger ships um can't turn so tightly and the small ships can do quite uh, tight turns so that's that is a factor in that you need to use those um i didn't really mention the rules but you could use the old-fashioned technique as well of, of turning uh the, your hex you know one 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 sort of degree on the hex corner and then moving but uh yeah i wanted it to have a more flowing feel which is why there's rulers in it to to move them along the rulers and the rulers are marked with inches so if your big ship can move sort of four inches, it can it can move around that curve in four inches, which will be a gentle sort of curving angle for the bigger ships, as I mentioned. And I think that makes it quite quick and fun to, to sort of move things around as well and quite easy. Rather than, again, you know, talking right in the detail now, but whenever I've played those sort of games and Full Thrust is one of them, I, you know, I love Full Thrust, still playing it even last month, but you do have to sort of really nudge your ship's you know, a tiny turn and then another, then another move forward and another tiny shift, and it takes time to do that. Although it's quite good fun. On this this game, it's just put the the curved ruler at the front of your little hex underneath your ship, and then move the ship around it, and uh, and then you're done without any need to do any little fiddly um, fiddly moves. It's still a little bit fiddly, but it's not as fiddly as you know twisting a, a, a small hex at one one corner. Mm. Yes, because uh, I must admit, you need for me because one of the sides is okay. Things you will need. One of the things is that it's like, oh, there's a, a turning template which is in the rules. Yeah. It's like, hang on a minute, <laughs> it's, it's in the back. No, it's not. <laughs> it's a PDF, and I should have put it in. That was that was an oversight. It's one of those things that I edited it at the front, and then, as I was saying, when you get into that last five percent and your brain's overloaded. I'd lost track of the fact that I was meant to put the uh, a copy in the rules that could be photocopied, but obviously I've put it up on Facebook. It's on the Brigade site, so people can easily uh, download it and print it from there. That's if they don't want to buy the uh, the, the Perspex uh, rules themselves. They look pretty. They do look nice. Yeah. But typically, the uh, typically you know, just as these rules are about to come out, uh, Peter West has posted on Facebook. So uh, the rules are coming out. What about future expansions? Um, are, you looking at, <laughs> are you looking at new fleets? Are you going to start bringing ground combat? How about campaigns? Well, we've got the author right here. Let's ask yes, him. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, in the in the stat cards, I have put uh, land buildings. Um, I've got forts. I've got anti-airship trucks, um, stations, army bases, hangars anti-aircraft towers so there's a whole string in there uh, mostly based on the range of um of the really nice sort of two mil scale um buildings that tony at brigade does so i pop them in there so that they could be used for the ground side of things for ground targets and for shooting from the ground locations so i've had lots of people talk about uh, supporting his land ironclad type miniatures as well uh, that may that may come as a supplement if this again it's going to depend if people are keen and they're starting to play it and i've already said that you know i know tony has a couple of extra um fleet ideas in the wings at the moment which are all top secret but um if there's a uh, if there's a new fleet coming out from tony i'll uh generate a um a pdf of the the ships in there it's quite easy for me to do that on my card format. I have like a process of a spreadsheet and then it pushes it into a, a document um, and then I can just push that out as well. So as long as, uh, you know, I keep in touch with Tony and I hear about the the new releases coming out and I'm sure we will stay in touch. We'll uh, we'll make sure we'll do a, a set of stat cards for them as well. Yeah. Of course, the, the perfect storm is always when you've got a, a set of rules tied to a specific set of miniatures. Because the two just feed off each other. People who buy the the miniatures get the rules, which then gets them to buy more miniatures, and it all just goes together lovely. So hopefully, you know, this is going to be good for you and and also good for Tony. Yeah, I hope so too. I hope so. You know, he's 
it's obviously it's been selling these models for many years. I don't know how many years. It must be I don't know, 16 years or something in that order, the, uh, the airship. So there should be a lot of people out there that are interested and, you know, hopefully we can, we can, we can grow it from there and I can add more details on the rules and clarify them uh, and work through as well. I mean, one thing I did think of already is that the fact that I can generate these, these cards quite easily if there were errors and omissions in there or if someone played with a particular one and said that's too, it's far too, the guns are too big on there or it's too weak and there was enough of a consensus, we could we could adjust them for a future release as well. Uh, uh, you know, and, and add more rules in. That's one thing I'm impressed by Fantasy Flight with the way they um, they develop their rules at the moment. The things like X-Wing, you know, two, three years down the road and they release a new um a new ship that has some new ability and it you know it, it has an impact back through the back catalog as well um you know i can't compete with those big guys but um it would be nice to sort of have that sort of continuation in there do you know if tony's going to carry on doing the starter fleets that you had in the kickstarter and and sell those as a sort of you know box sets or is he just gonna he's on? always had starter fleets actually yeah. um so- I'd like there are, to. There are yeah. several starter fleets on the site, aren't there? There are. I, what I'd like to encourage Tony to do, though, is also maybe do a bundle. I, no, I've I've said to him that's fine with the rules, as in um, he could reduce the the price of the book or his miniatures, or one way or the other, to say here's a starter set. You get the rules, you get a set of rulers, you get maybe some custom the custom dice, um, and and a, and a starter fleet. So you know, I'd be keen so? to support Tony doing that. So yeah. So so if you're listening, folks, Tony will be at Harrowwood, and you can ask him. You can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I assume yeah, cause... he'll have. I assume he'll have your rules, everybody. When's this? Is this this weekend? This the fourth of September. Fourth. Oh well, that's very interesting because that that works very well because I've got all the rules. So yeah, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. You heard it and, here first, folks. Yeah. So I was chatting to him today, um, and just I just need to organise when I uh, drop them over to him in the car, which is going to be in the next week. So yeah. I can't see. I can't see that being a problem at all. Obviously, we need to they get our order, up, we so. need to get the orders out of the door though, because um, we don't want to be sell, doing that classic thing of selling it before the uh, uh, before the Kickstarters uh, have been shipped out. Yeah. Exactly, this, especially mm. as I'm one of the Kickstarter backers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, knowing Tony, uh, he's quite. He knows where people are, and people do keep in touch with him. So there might be some people that he doesn't have to post it to, if they are at the show. Um, but you know, obviously, Tony will need to be sure that he's doing that. Uh, uh, so I need to leave that logistics side to him. But yeah, that that could be a possibility for for backers. Mm, so, yeah, interestingly. So, so, so yes, Harrowwood could be the first time uh, people outside, maybe even outside the backers, could get their hands on the DS. Yeah, if we can get them posted out the door, um, and I'm looking at the date 17th, we've got half a month almost left to go. Um, it, it could well trust, be that, trust me, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't feel like it. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we've got everything that needs to go out. Uh, Tony's finished the castings. I've. Um, I've got the rule books, I've got all the rulers, so everything's ready to go. It's just a case of um, packing them up, and there's about, well, there's 160 orders, um, so it's quite a lot of packing, but, um, yeah, I can't see that being a big problem. So I'm, I'm going to PM Mike's next question, which is, do you want to come to Hellwood and put on a demo game of, uh, of Imperial Skies? <laughs> well, I, I hadn't had any plans for that, actually, but that, that could be a possibility as well. Mike, do you have space? What day's the when's the fourth? Sunday you know, the fourth. Sunday the fourth. I'm on actually that week I'm on holiday, but I am back by the Friday. I'm um, pretty sure we can find you space. Yeah, so let's talk about that one offline. Um <laughs> it's uh, I won't commit to <laughs> uh, live on air uh, or live on podcast, but yeah. Con- we'll, contactable uh, through the usual podcast addresses, Nicholas. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. So, so yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I can do a very quick summary of the rules if you like. Uh, I'll whiz through them just for, for if I if I can. Um, yeah, please. But, but basically, yeah, please. yeah it's it's it's, it's obviously it's turn based. Um, however, there is an initiative uh, phase. Um, but you uh, each turn when you roll for that initiative, before you do that, there's a command uh, feature in the rules where you roll a d6 uh, plus one for your flagship. 
and that gives you a certain amount of command points. So you can influence the initiative using some of those command points, if you like. Um, but then there's other uses of those command points across your fleet as well. So for models that are within 30 inches of your um, flagship, you can put those little command pips, of which we, we do some tokens, but you can use anything. You could use a dice or a, a gem or something to uh, represent these command points being placed around on different ships. They then get certain um, extra functions you can do with those, so you can make them go a bit faster. Um, you can um, allow them to take uh, extra gunnery shots that, uh, that turn. Um, and you can also do a couple of interesting things with command where you can use a screen as well. So... Uh, again, that was from based on traditional sort of Navy rules um, that you can do sort of screening maneuvers would be done with smaller smaller ships. Uh, and I've abstracted that. So as long as some ships are in the right arc, they don't have to be completely blocking line of sight between one firing ship and the target. As long as you've got a, some ships that have got this command assigned to them and they're near your, they're within, I think it's four inches of the of the flagship, you can, you can transfer damage. So up to four points per um, screening ship. You can transfer that damage away from your main ship. Um, and that's, again, abstracted way of just giving you a nice, interesting way to make use of the having those smaller ships fielded. Because, again, as I've said before, people quite often don't like to field the small fries, um, the, the small destroyer. Well, the destroyers are slightly bigger, but the little tiny uh, boats. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that uh, there was another reason to have them, and that was to sort of screen and defend your, your larger ships in the game too. Uh, yeah, so, and then basically turn sequence is pretty normal that you move a ship and then you fire it and you work through alternating backwards and forwards between the uh, the players moving and, and shooting. So there might be some point later in game where winning that initi initiative is really vital. So if you rolled a good command dice, you could throw some of those command points into rolling and adding to your initiative to make sure you you know you got the shot off first additionally there is an altitude but it's an optional rule again as we mentioned earlier wanted to keep it simple so things like altitude aren't part of the cool rules but they're quite well detailed and there's three levels you've got a sort of high high one and then you've got a cruising kind of battle altitude and then you've got low altitude uh, so those three levels are reflected and there's rules around how you move from each uh, height to the other one. Again, nice and simple. If you use those telescopic style um, bases, which you can you can pop by these days, you could use those to represent the heights. But you could also just put tokens on there to say whether they're high, medium, uh, battle, or, or on the ground or, or low level. So yeah, um, there's bits and pieces there about clouds obscuring as well. So I've tried to sort of cover off every angle. Uh, I'm also quite a, a probably it's kind of an OCD thing, but if I have something in there, I want to make sure it's detailed, even if it's light sort of rules. So things like carriers, I made sure that I, uh, you know, there's descript a clear description of how do you launch your fighters off the carriers, how do you bring them back on, and then rules where, say for example, a fighter wing had taken some damage when it lands on its carrier. The next round, when it's launched again, it's considered to be repaired. And obviously, that's not necessarily that the wing has had instant repair work done on it, but it just means that a full a full wing has been able to be relaunched again from that carrier. So things like those little details are in there. And destroyer tenders as well. So you can have a couple of Tony's really nice larger models have small destroyer ships actually on deck with cranes on there. Um, so I wanted to make sure that was represented as well so they can go to battle and launch a destroyer from them um, and those destroyers can then come back on board to be repaired too. Yeah, so there's. I try to make sure everything's covered from taking off from the ground, landing, obviously the fighters, shooting at targets on ground, you know, so bombing runs and things as well. And uh, there are bombers in here too. And again, Tony's got some really nice models. I mean, those sort of things really excite me. Something about my youth and, and liking small things, Lego or what have you, in the past, I, when I see Tony's collection of miniatures with the uh, brigade models and see the um, the small carriers and then the fighters that go on them. And then I mean, let's bombers. face it, this is, this is a constant refrain. Tony yes, has some yeah. really, really nice models. <laughs> they are. I don't say that again. They are great, yes. Yeah, so. oh, I've got some of his 
one twelve hundred buildings for sales of glory, and they're just gorgeous. They are as well. And I know he goes around historical sites and photos those if he's on holiday. And he's had some time in France where he's gone around forts. He's taken the photos and then brought in other um, you know resources off uh, the internet, and then uses three D design to make it as accurate as possible. So you're getting some really good uh, accurate historical miniatures there. Now, you did mention custom dice. Now, I want to point out, uh, when you say custom dice, you mean custom dice colours as opposed to custom dice with different symbols on them? Yes, it's not your X-Wing symbols. They're just, uh, we've just, as part of the rules, to keep it simple again, so that if you were firing a big ship at range, airship, you, um, you'd, you'd get, a, obviously, a handful of dice together, uh, but I wanted to keep it so that you could see what the difference was. So you'd have sort of red dice are the um, are for your main guns, your big bore guns, orange dice for um, medium bore guns, and then yellow dice for the sort of rapid fire um, small bore uh, guns on deck. So the idea was you don't have to play it like this. You could just, if you've got a bucket of white dice, you could roll them for you. You could roll your big guns and then your small um, separately. But I wanted to keep it quick again, so I've referenced that on the cards, so that when you're playing, you can look down at a card and go, "Oh, I've got two big bore, which would be two red dice, you know, five small uh, medium bore, so that's you know five orange dice." Uh, so I've matched the dice colours to the the guns, so that you could just roll them all at once, and then quickly go, "Okay, well I know those ones do one damage at that range, those ones do one damage at a short, at a longer range, that kind of thing, to make it nice and quick and easy to play. Um, and I think, I, I don't know, maybe people have got more disposable cash these days. There's so many, um, you know, flames of war you can buy, or a bolt action. Obviously, bolt action uses very specific dice, but almost every game you can buy dice to match up to your army faction or something. So I thought I'd let um, players um, have an option here to, to speed things up by picking dice that matched the uh, the stack cards to make it obvious what they were rolling. And then I had colorblind com- people complain um, because my three colors aren't distinct for colorblind people, unfortunately. So I, all I can do is apologize for that. And in the future, I'll do black, white, and, and another a mid-tone <laughs> so to make it easier for colorblind people. But for, for this rule set, I'd kind of already got 90% through um, with those dice. But... Uh, hadn't taken into consideration that so that's another thing for people to think about if they're doing games with dice is to to have a think about how colorblind people would look at them i've, I've seen that on quite a few games recently whenever i see a, a new board game there's always somebody who turns around and says these aren't suitable for people who've got you know any sort of color blindness yes and it's, yeah. you know it, it's something i never thought about before I hadn't until people said it. A couple of people, right? I think only two people raised it, and maybe one of them was raising it. My my wife is blue green color blind, and I, I I tend to sort of keep an eye out for it, just for that reason. I yeah, interesting. I had a, a, a local friend um, down here in Sussex who was a amazing painter. Although he used sort of enamels, he did incredible job on painting and washes but he was completely colorblind and he used to just get his wife his wife would look at a picture and say you need to use that pot of paint that pot of paint that pot of paint and then he would just go for it um but incredible painter he just couldn't quite see what the colors were they all looked a bit of a mishmash to him so that's interesting yeah so uh, i was talking about the rules briefly uh there um so with with those three gun types as i mentioned the main guns obviously they fire at 30 inch range And then you have, um, if I can find the page, you have 20-inch range for the medium guns and out to 10 for the short. And that was my simplification coming in again. I didn't want to have a weapons range table that had ranges all over the place for each faction of differences of an inch here or an inch there. So it's just those three core ranges, 10, 20, and 30 inches. So the main guns have got a good distance on them. That leads me to say now that, you know, your minimum size table probably needs to be four foot by four foot, but ideally four by six foot uh, so that you've got some distance on there. And, yeah, so when you're out at 30, 30 inches, the main guns can obviously uh, get targets. When you're at 20, you've got the medium and 10 is just the small ones up close. And the damage um, is incremented on the dice as you get to the nearer ranges. So just give an example of that at 
at 30 inches or uh, up to 30, between 20 and 30, your D6 red dice will do one point of damage to the hull of the target on a six, which, as I mentioned before, is explosive dice. So if you're lucky to roll a six, you can roll again. Yeah. But if you're firing that main gun at, at the tw- up to the t- between the 10 and 20 inch range, it it does a point of damage on five or six. And then if you're firing it really close at up to 10 inches, that red dice or the main guns is, is will do damage on four, five or six. So as you're getting closer, things get very sort of nasty in terms of the amount of damage you can do uh, and bring to bear on uh, on from some of the bigger battleships. The- uh, obviously, the medium and the short guns are graded accordingly. So short guns do, uh, do a five or six at short range. Uh, at nor to ten, and then uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, right. so so it's 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 very very intuitive. That's the idea, and also I tell you, it was really hard uh, profiling all the different fleets because everybody had a different view on it. I bought Conway's fighting ships, which are quite expensive books. I bought their book that handled fleets of the world up until nineteen. 19- 08, I think it is from the uh, from the 19th century up to then, and then I bought the World War II, World War One onward book, and I read all the different sections in there to try and find differences, and I found that in World War One the British fleets were very had very good destroyers, um, so that was a that was a key thing for me. I made their destroyers a little bit better, faster, um, and with more guns on there. And that's another big question because uh, when I'm playing with these historical guys up at Stoke Rochford, they know how many main guns all the different ships have. They've kind of got it in their brains already. But I've abstracted that in this rule because the number of dice you're rolling for those main guns is a factor of both the ship's ability to gain a target and the damage that they can do. Um, so it's not specifically just the number of guns on deck and uh, for some people that some people like to have it very accurate so that if they're firing a a particular german ship if they're very historical minded they want a specific number of uh, uh, main guns but this is an abstractive amount so you might have exactly the same battleship side by side a german one and a british one um, but in these rules uh, you may find that the german or the well it's actually the british ones uh, have a slightly higher factory in one area uh, than than the Germans or the Germans have got slightly higher armor as well. So I've tried to put those differences in based on some historical influence from these books I've read as well. And that was quite hard, really, because when you uh, when you're faced with, I can't remember exactly what it is, but I think there's about twelve twelve to fourteen perhaps different nations. I'm just mm. flipping through now. We've got Swiss, Belgium, Japanese, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, French, obviously the Germans and the and USA. And trying to bring in a difference between them was very hard, but uh, it, it took a long time, a lot of play, a lot of feedback from people saying, oh, I, d- I think that's a bit weak for a, you know a ship of that size. So uh, you know, there's quite a lot of adjustments in there, and some of those are um, quite obvious things, like the French ships look sleeker and faster, so I made them slightly faster uh, speed at the high end, so their battleships might be an inch or two quicker than the equivalent German one. And then the Russian one would be even slower again, but with more armor armor hull to, to eat through. So you kind of, you know, when you're doing these games, like like the like the War Machine games, you have the Kador Russian ones, don't you? Russians always yeah. seem to be themed as heavy, slow, heavily armored. The Americans all seem to be quite sort of middle of the road. You know, so there's there's those themes you get through lots of games where you're trying to represent differences. And certainly I wanted to do that in these rules, but, you know, hopefully that's reflected enough to make them feel enough enough of a difference in there, like the Japanese. I think I might have mentioned before, Japanese have more torpedoes, which are winged, you know, small winged-based torpedoes. So, yeah. No tentacles, then? No tentacles, but more torpedoes and better at medium range as well. So some things have to close in. Uh, whereas you might have a, a British um, battleship be able to stand off a bit more from the battle and, and throw in long range uh, long range guns, that kind of thing is built in uh, in there. So yeah, uh, that's a very that's in cool. a nutshell for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what I need to do now. I've got all my rules here, and uh, I will do a, a a video soon on YouTube. So um, I'll get that organised. Excellent. 
and is that your uh, uh, is that your wife that is my wife ringing for a lift <laughs> so yes i will have to wrap up now and thanks very much for for having me on the show well I mean, it's been a pleasure as always mate thank you so much yeah. for coming on and talking to us yeah, and uh, as I say, I've got that Tommy's World War One, and I'm doing lots of reading on that period and reading biographies and things. So you know, hopefully, I'll, I can come back, maybe give a give you a chat as work in progress on that, rather than waiting and well, I don't want to wait three years, but wait 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 until I finish. I'll I'll, I'll do a, a midway through chat, maybe. Cool, that'd be, that'd be and, really we, like, and we may see you at Harrowwood. Yes, that's exciting news. Actually, I didn't realise that could come together. If Tony's there as well, that that could really work. Well, I'm pretty sure we can find you space. So if it yeah. works out at your end, get in touch. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, thanks very much then, guys. Brilliant. Thanks, Great. Robbie. Much appreciated. Thanks, thanks for you soon. Okay, cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. And now it's time to hear from you as we open up the Meeples and Miniatures mailbag. Okay. <clears throat> I think we all know there should just be one. That's your benchmark. God, Henry. Basic stuff. Page 47 of Mr. R. Reesley's. <laughs> R.P. Eastley. R.P. Eastley, yeah. RP... <laughs> yes, have you not listened to the latest view from the veranda? Do you not know that actually, he, when he saw Mr. R.P. Reesley, Mr. Mr. Reesley then, no, sorry, it's been revised since then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, right. Uh, uh, yes, so on Wednesday, uh, during the day, I posted on our Twitter feed and on our Facebook group that we were going to be recording and have you have you any questions for the mailbag? And we were inundated in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to everybody who uh, who, who who posted questions. Uh, there was, unfortunately, there is no way we're going to have time to get through everything on this show, but we will do our best to get through as many as many as we can, and uh, we will come back and and some more uh, on on a subsequent show. But we will give it a fe- we, we we will give it a jolly good go to begin with. Okay, so first off, oh well, I'll answer. A very, a, a very quick one. We, and we kind of touched on this already in the show. From Lukey Boy uh, on Twitter, who said, Why are you struggling to complete your six mil army? Is, is there not as much satisfaction in painting smaller scales? Really interesting question. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think sometimes I have to be in the right mood and, you know, for stuff that I'm wanting to paint and, I've just been, I don't know, I've just been struggling with them at the moment, uh, in, in, in all honesty. I mean, you know, small scale stuff. I, I, earlier I was talking about painting Planetfall. You know, I mean, Planetfall's 10 mil. Uh, but having said that, the majority of those are all vehicles and stuff, which are, you know, quite big vehicles and stuff. And it's a bit like painting 15 mil tanks and that. Uh, so, is there the same, is there, is there not as much satisfaction? I think there is. But just from my point of view, I think I just have to be in the mood for it. And, I'm just not there at the moment. That's the same for me. I, I've got to be in the mood to paint something. If I'm not, I, I can't force myself to finish painting something. I'll, I'll leave it until eventually I'll get around to it. Yeah. Uh, it also, that, also that rumbling sound of a deadline approaching. That's always a great motivator. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, if I've got a deadline and I've got to paint by, I, I'll, I'll not do it. It's probably why I don't do competitions. I've really got to be in the mood to paint something I'll, I'll get a you know i'll, I'll get a, a hash to to do some painting and that's it i'll just paint it but i i've had some figures sat on my desk for two or three months and it it, it doesn't matter what deadline comes i it, if i'm not in the mood i won't paint them because i know that if i'm not in the mood and i try to paint them i'll, I'll do a half ass job mm. yeah I, so I think that's it yeah it's just one of these things of I mean, they've been sat on my desk for for months now, and yeah, all, all, all from this idea of uh, oh, let, let's do let's do shot boxes in ten mil, and I think at the point where both myself and Dave kind of go, yeah, okay, let's do it, yeah, we'll end, yeah we'll end up doing it pretty quickly. But I, I'm just getting distracted with other things at the moment. Interesting question. Well, self examination. Oh, 
<laughs> Not good. So, so yeah, Pat, Pat Gilliland asserts we are in a new golden age of gaming. We'll take that as read and we'll discuss that one some other time. Mm. But with the plethora of great new game systems and miniatures on the market, how do you decide what to buy into apart from listening to the M&M reviews? Well, simple in my case, I buy what Neil tells me to. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> Oh, dear me. Most of my miniature purchases in the, since I got back into the hobby have been directly or indirectly caused by something on this bleeping podcast. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't apologise. No. Seriously. Um, but I think there's a degree. I mean, stepping back from it a little more seriously, we are in, I think, a bit of what, what you could term an echo chamber in that the people who follow the podcast and thus are people I follow on blogs and Facebook, etc., 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 have very similar tastes in gaming to me. The end result is that the things they talk about, the things that we talk about on the podcast are things that generally appeal to me and to us because that's why we do the Believe In podcast. End result, we review things on the podcast we either like or are interested in and, strangely enough, end up buying. Hmm. But how do you decide what to buy into? Uh, well, I mean, sometimes you get it catastrophically wrong. Um, <laughs> yes. 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 Exilis. Uh, Exilis. Ex- 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 uh, and funny enough, there was another, yeah, there was another question regarding that, which we'll come on to in a minute. That, that was the first time for ages that I actually bought into a system and actually really enjoyed it and then kind of, it, it, you know, and it, oh, yeah, yeah, tanked horribly. So sometimes you do get it wrong. These days, I think it's, it's a trade off between, it has to be the right genre uh, and, and a decent set of rules. To me, nowadays, unless it's something really niche, you know, I, I don't just see the figures or something and kind of go, ooh, cool. Although I have done that recently with, um, what was that, uh, uh, Burrows and Badgers. Because Burrows and Badgers is like, oh, they're really nice. More and more now, it's, it's more, much more a case of, first and foremost, it's all it's all about whether it's a good game or not. If we see something that's a good game, then I'll, I'll, consi- I'll, I'll consider getting into it. However, even even now, uh, and it's something I think we talked about before, it's what Mr. Luffy is now harping on about to me all the time. And he keeps banging on and banging on and banging on about it. Is if you're going to buy, but if you're going to buy a game, make sure you know you do realise that it, ha- it, it has to be at least as good, if not better, than what you're already playing. Otherwise, why are you buying it? Which is, which I suppose is, is an interesting question in itself. You know, are you buying it just for the sake of the fact that it's new, or, or what? And yeah, in some ways, it is, it is difficult because there is so there is so much out there now. And, and I suppose, in one sense, you know, the hobby is more fractured than it ever was, than ever before. But yeah, because I mean, there's stuff. Yeah, there is stuff coming out all the time for for, for loads of different bits and pieces. How how do I decide? Does something appeal to me? Or is it in a genre that appeals to me? So, you know, Halo. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll get into, I'll get into Halo because I like the Halo universe. For example, other people don't like it. You know, so, so, so ignore it. You know, but Halo, yeah, that's for me. Interesting ideas with, uh, interesting, you know, I mean, Chain of Command, Platoon World War Two. I've always gained Platoon World War Two. And, and, and that's, and, that, and that's why I looked at that in the first place. You know, the fact that it turned out to be the best one out there, anyway, in my opinion. Uh, is you know it was an extra bonus, but that's something I was, I was you know if, if there is a platoon World War Two game, I will generally at least have a look at it. Other guys, I was going to say, for me, it depends on what day of the week it is. Um, <laughs> it is. I got so many reasons and how how loose the shelves are. Awesome. Of that. <laughs> it's, yeah, you I took mean, the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest. It's so many different things can pull me into. A game, but, but it depends on the game. So, if it's like an historical game, then I will always do two forces. So, okay, Chain of Command came out. Never really played Platoon level World War Two before. Played it with with Neil at Riches. Loved it. Bought the rules. Bought a couple of forces. Converted some more twenty mil stuff I had for another game to play with it. But then you start thinking. What else can I do with this system? Because now I've got the, the one set, the, the one game. It's World War Two. I've got all of World War Two I could, I could cover. So now I'm looking at early war. I'm looking at desert war. You know, so there's all that thing with sharp practice. 
you know, you get a sharp practice. And we said this when we were at um, at the Lardy's day. Most of us are looking at four different, four or five different periods of history to play with that one set of rules. Yeah. Only two. Yeah. So far. So far, yeah. You know, but so so that's an example of sets of rules bringing you into different areas that you want to play. But then again, I collected um, a 15 more Napoleonic armies for, for Waterloo because I wanted to play Napoleon the War. I like the rules. But I've also gone out now and bought another two or three different sets of rules to play with those figures because this time instead of having the rules driving the figures I want to buy, it's now the figures driving the fact that I could buy multiple different games and see which one's the best because, you know, for me, dropping 15, 20 quid on a set of rules is nothing compared to dropping a couple of hundred quid on, on the figures. So it's all different things. And it's, you know, it's really difficult to, to sort of turn around and say, this is the one thing because it's so many different ways. And, you know, games like, um, open combat and, uh, and, um, Overworld got me into looking at little fantasy groups, you know, so I was looking at little, the little fantasy figure collections like, Conan. yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's a whole different thing, but yeah, Conan can be used now, but you know, um, there's lots of firms that do little ranges of figures. There's a guy who did, um, t- um, t- um t- the time robbers set. Hmm. You know, six of those. Great. That's a, a, a nice open combat force. Talking of which, have you just seen he's just yes. done the bad guys for them? Yes, he has. Yes. yes. <laughs> David Warner yeah. has never but, looked so good in 28 mil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, did, I, did I mention that, that open combat will be at Herowood? Uh, oh, excellent. That's good. For, for big things. I think I, really I got away with that. You did. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, if it's a big thing, I really had to think about it. So I really thought long and hard about doing a, a 15 mil Napoleonic army because I knew I had to do two. Hmm. But once you've got that, I'll buy umpteen sets of rules to play those with those figures. But I'm quite happy to take a punt on small little ranges or small little skirmish games because they're, you know, they're not that expensive to get into. You know, if you can drop 50 quid and get a starter set to try out a game, I'll, I'll give it a go. If it's something that I'm vaguely interested in, which is why Halo Ground Command, I've I got no interest in it at all, so I'm not going to get it. Because, mm. like I say, it's going to dilute what I'm doing. So there we go. There you have it. Next. Yeah. Next. Okay. Okay. So actually, possibly the flip coin, uh, the flip side of that, which is a question we had off Facebook from Richard Crawley. Okay. So. Why do people stop playing games that are no longer in print? If the f- if one set of rules did it for you, why do you switch to another set because they're more fashionable? Because we're sheep and everybody else does. Yeah. I know that's a glib answer, but you will notice, I mean, I will notice, you guys won't because you don't play it, but the amount of WAB that gets played since GW dropped Warhammer Historical, has gone through the floor. Mm. Uh, and it hasn't... The rules the rules are still the rules they were, um, whatever you might think about them. Um, yes, other rules have come out which were better, and I think that may have something to do with it, but there's still a lot of people with a big investment in WAB who have just stopped playing it. And there's, as you say, there's actually no reason to... Unless it is one of these things of, you know, you play as part of a community and, and, the, the, yeah. and the community stops playing it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, you know, one, you know, one that could... said, that said, there are still people who play Research Group 6th edition. Yeah. They meet every year at, um, at uh, Derby Wells, don't they? And they get together. It's like, you know, why buy the new edition of 40K when it, you know, when that comes out every X number of years, or you know, why buy Age of Sigma uh, rather than still playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle? It's more the case in games of the tournament scene that if if your tournament scene has any backing from the manufacturer or from the community, you will find that things like that you've got to move along to move with yes. what the community is doing. Yes, that kind um, of drives it for. Doesn't it? 
that that so that's always going to drive it for it's one of the things that is not making me terribly happy about Dreadball Second Edition because I can't see it being better than Dreadball First. There, there are some people out there who will just find a set of rules and play them. You know, yeah. the people in, people in, in my old club, their their games of choice are, are Spearhead for World War Two and um, Shaco for Napoleonics, and they played them for twenty years or so, and they they keep playing them. I, I'm not that sort of person. I quite like trying out new things. And there's also the, the, there's the fact that, that in a lot of the periods that I'm interested in, something better has come along. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there are there are better mass battle ancient systems than WAB. There are better World War II systems than Operation Squad, which I used to love. And so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And it's whatever people want to play. And But it's, it's nice going back and playing all games. I I, I quite like going back and playing Man of War and Epic. You know, it's nice just them off and pl- playing with the old figures again. It is interesting. I, I mean, I, okay. I mean, Richard, from the, uh, uh, as I kind of hinted earlier, uh, brought up the question of, well, why don't you play Excelis anymore? Excelis is, is a bit of an exception in the fact that because it was computer generated, uh, or, or sorry, computer moderated, actually, uh, their website, which they claimed had been, you know, was was up and supported for years and stuff, actually went down. So, as a system, you physically cannot play the game anymore because you know it's it's just not available, and they never got round to producing the rules for it. Uh, so that's why that sort of thing just kind of died. However, at the same time, we we were talking about um, Commander Horizon, okay, six mil game, uh, six mil sci fi that used to be produced by Bacchus. Okay, which both myself and Dave have painted armies for. I have a painted six mil sci-fi army, folks. Honest, I do. And Pete Berry sold uh, sold it to. I think it's the guys at Morgan's Emporium in Sheffield. They have since come out with a completely new edition of the game, and they completely redesigned it. However. The old set of the rules, the old set, there's nothing wrong with the old set of rules. And, you know, we have actually all, you know, th- those rules cover the forces that we have. The forces, you know, so actually there's no, we were only, we were only chatting last night and saying, there's actually no reason why we shouldn't still be playing it. Because, you know, we enjoyed the game just because it's no longer general, you know, I mean, actually you can still get the models. But, you know, I mean, you know, I think they're sold a bit differently now, but you can still actually buy the models. So, but there's actually no reason not to play that game. I mean, the fact for me is the fact that actually probably Planet Falls better, but, uh, that, I mean, you know, the day's a bit funny sometimes on things like, you know, <laughs> what, new sci fi game? Oh, don't know about that. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I'll, I mean, I'll be playing Planet Fall with Josh. Uh, so that's not a problem, but there is no, there's no reason at all why we can't play Commander Horizon. Because you reuse the figures. But if you, again, if you've got a decent, if, if you've got a decent game, that you, oh, yeah, oh, oh, cause I mean, th- 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 these are all, ba- these are all on 60, 60 by 60 bases, you see. So yeah, th- yeah, so there are bases, so, so like you had three tanks on a base and stuff like this. Whereas now they've changed the system, so all, all your miniatures are, are based individually and stuff. But as I say, the old game is, works perfectly well. And there's only two of us. We both have armies for it, so why don't we play it? It's a, you know, there's no reason to stop us. It's a very good question. Why don't you play it? Why don't you play it? Because you've got to learn the rules again. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that, I mean, for me, there is that. Uh, yeah, mm. at, at the same time, you know, uh, I mean, you yeah, know, the amount of rules I get through, I mean, these days it's like, you know, I mean, Dave will kind of go, uh, uh, yeah, how do you do this now? Because uh, Dave can't keep rules in his head, but I can. So, so it's, it's just a case of me relearning the rules and then kind of, uh, and then, yeah, but but uh, yeah, it's a it's a valid question. It's like yeah, why do yeah you know, why do it? And uh, as, as you say, I think at the end of the day, it, it basically boils down to who you game with and what sort of community you're involved with. Mm. Yeah, all right. A, a nice quick one. Go on. from Ben Fine. Hello, Ben. What is the one period slash gaming fad that you could just never get into? 
Mine is ACW. It just never grabbed me. That was Ben. That was Ben Ben saying that. Yeah. No, I agree with Ben. ACW couldn't just. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's. I know it's a huge period uh, for uh, lots of people interested in. It's never really grabbed me. Uh, have I you bo- ever played it? I haven't, but the same in the all. It just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my my couple of games I've had, I really enjoyed this period. I will be getting into at some point. Yeah, uh, I, I ended up buying Battle Cry. The 150th edition of Battle Cry because I found, because, uh, yeah, okay, that, okay, oh, that's a board game, but it's like, I felt at least then I, I owned an, I, I owned something that did ACW. Uh, yeah, cause I always felt, oh, it's one big period, really, I, sh- I should be, you know, I should be getting into it, I should enjoy it, but I'm sorry, it just, it just doesn't appeal. It is really strange, but it, you know, it just doesn't grab me. I might try it in sharp yeah. practice. But um, I played quite a bit of Fire and Fury. <laughs> that's only because only you want to buy the Perry's box set, mate. <laughs> well, if you want to try it with sharp practice, come to the club. <laughs> <laughs> it's a I, bit far from Cardiff. <laughs> yeah. I think I think mine is modern. I've got no interest in anything post-1970. I'll, I'll do Vietnam, because I quite like Vietnam. But after that, no. Mine, War Machine. I just cannot see the point. Actually, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I played that one when the first came out. Was, uh, I know we have we have a whole bunch of folks down at the club who play it, who really enjoy it, and I just don't get it. It just does nothing for me at all. I think when it first came out, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, the the very, very first edition, the the original box, just playing with the original box set, uh, that was fun. Josh is massively into it. Josh, play, uh, uh, Josh plays um, Circle of Orbis in, in, in Hordes. Uh, Josh loves it, but I kind of know. I kind of know what you mean. Uh, for me, uh, I kind of saw where. Uh, well, I mean, uh, apparently third edition is different, but I enjoyed it when it first came out. And I, actually, I had quite a bit. Uh, it, was, it was one of the, that was at the time where I kind of went. I, I bought it and kind of went. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll get stuff. Stuff. So I actually, I actually had quite a large Menoth and Crix army, and then decided actually this is just going to turn into an arms race. And yeah, how much money do you want to spend? So I stopped. But I, I understand it might have changed since then. But I mean that that was that that, that was first edition. That was prime with first edition. Again, games appeal to particular. Uh, I, th- I think it's a game that appeals to a particular sort of gamer. Mm. All right. Um, another quick one from our friend Siga at Battle Bus Studios, one of our favourite North Europeans. I can't remember whether he comes from Norway or Sweden. He, he's of the Scandinavian persuasion. Yes, for them. <laughs> Scandinavian. <laughs> Scandinavians. And he says, "Have you ever played a campaign to the end?" Yes. Next question. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. Not yet. I'm in the middle of one. You've, but you're taking a break, aren't you? Uh, yeah, we got distracted from doing World War Two. We do, it's all pairs fault uh, because we had to go. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, because, yeah because we had to play. Uh, because we had to play Saga. All of a sudden, he's interrupted World War Two, and then we get distracted with Bluka. <laughs> all right, this, this is a question to, to uh, Mr. Whitaker because he's the organised one. Do you play? You, you play a lot of campaigns at, at your club, don't you? Some, some. Yeah. Is it the club that keeps the campaigns alive? Yeah, no, it's the campaign organizer. Right. Um, there's a there's subtle difference. Uh, yes, having a captive group of players that you see every week is really useful, but you need a campaign organizer who's supposed to be prepared to kick, bully, and chase and make sure that everything gets played. And some of you may remember some very tasty photos from a really massive uh, black powder game last summer. Mm-hmm. Which was, in fact, the last game of our um, hundred days campaign. So yes, we did finish a campaign, and it was awesome. Yeah, I don't ever have. But that was largely down to the fact that Gary organised it, kept chivying people, ensured there were always games to play, and it was a narrative campaign, not a ladder. It was a proper campaign. It wasn't a ladder campaign or or any of these these pathetic excuses for campaigns that people call club campaigns. It was a proper map based um, with an objective, and and it worked, and it was great fun. Mm. Cool. Go on. Last one. 
Hello. Uh, you know, hang on. Um, oh, here we are. Um, Henry Hyde. Hello, um, Henry. Asks. Hello, Henry. Yes, asks. The points value of a naked warrior should be five. Discuss. I'm sorry, Henry. You're completely wrong. It should be one. I think we're out of time, aren't we, guys? Uh, well, Looking at the watch. Well, well it, <laughs> yeah. is, it is ten past eleven. Yeah. So no, maybe, we should wrap it up here. So, Sorry, Henry, you might have to leave that one till last y- time. Y- yes, we'll have to. Uh, yeah, I think points discussions, that's going to take ages. I think we're going to have to come back to that. One, uh, it's one. It's one. <laughs> Don't ask me to justify uh, it. It can't be it's one, leaves one. you no granularity. Yeah, just one. <laughs> right. Uh, now, guys, I, I know there is an awful lot of questions that we haven't uh, answered. Uh, thank you so much for them. Now, what we will do is the ones we haven't answered... Uh, we're going to storm away and we're going to come back to you on the next show and uh, we will we will get through them in 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 a couple of shows because because there are loads uh there thank you loads. so much uh, yeah thank you so much but to everybody we uh, yeah we really it's appreciate probably it probably fair to say though that given our past history of questions we will not get to all of them and we're really really sorry and we beca- and in some cases because they sort of dwindle with relevancy as time goes by in some cases it's because we run out of time so every now and then we will ask um ask for another lot of questions and if your favorite question didn't get answered last time ask it again yeah and just to um preempt what neil just said about it being in, in the next show it may not be it might be in the show after who knows, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yes we'll we'll see best uh, it's time to wrap up i think yes best yeah. endeavors and all that Okay, so, uh, yes, so, uh, I think on that note, uh, uh, are we about done, guys? I think we are. Indeed. Well, I'm well and done. Well and done. <laughs> well, it's your fault we're recording this late, mate. Not that I wanted to bring that up at all, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's entirely fair, entirely fair. I was the one with the church band rehearsal, and I was the one who insisted we rehearse the bridge to uh, build your kingdom here until we got it right, because I'm a slave driver. Yes, of course, but uh, but, uh, but obviously, of course, actually, the real, re- the, the re- whose real fault it was is, is Hobbes' Me. guts. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, but then, given that that was because I commissioned Annie to, so it's still my fault. Oh, it's still yeah, your hey, fault. I'm oh. like, my wife blames me all the time. What's new? <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's about it for this show. Uh, don't for- don't forget, as if, as if you could forget in this show, don't forget if you're listening to this and it's before the 4th of September, on the 4th of September, what is it, Mike? Um, uh, it's a Sunday. Um, um, I'm not going to church for some reason. I can't really- oh, here it That's it. <laughs> Indeed, it's it's the Heavenwood show. Listening to, if you're listening to it after the fourth of September, you missed a doozy. You missed it, indeed. Uh, yes. So obviously, on the next show, one thing we will be doing is to, is, is is chatting a little bit about Heavenwood. Fourth uh, fourth September, come and, and 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 see some of us and lots of other people. I can't think what else I'm doing. I think I'm doing Heavenwood and that, and, and 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 that's about it. I'm probably uh, my, my my life is 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 a void past the fourth of September until the fourth of September gets there. I think. <laughs> so, what's on the next show then, Neil? Excellent question. Well presented. You want me to tell He's you? Good at those, you know. <laughs> um, well, uh, um, at this point, I will defer the question to the person who is organised on this uh, uh, on this podcast crew, which is <laughs> well, the, person who, the, the, the person who asked the question, Mister <laughs> Hobbs. What is on the next show? On the next show, we're having Sam Mustafa back. Where we're going to be discussing oh, yes. uh, what he's been up to, and um, yeah, well. Probably have a bit of a round table on a few other subjects as well. A few interesting topics for discussion Ooh. on that one. Yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, from from what Sam is interested in talking about and everything, guys, do not miss that one. It is liable that's to be, be a doozy. Sure. Yeah, that's going to be a good show. Sam is always great to talk to, and um, he's been he, he's been chatting and to, oh, I, I'd like to talk about this. I'd like to talk about that. What why don't we talk about this? So yeah, that promises to be a really interesting interview. And uh, well, depending how it goes, kind of that actually, uh, well, as Mike hinted, that might be all we have time for. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it could be a long yeah. one. <laughs> that could be a biggie. That could. Yeah, indeed. Having whetted your appetite. <laughs> Well, I'll say goodbye. Uh, we will. Indeed. So, yeah, once again. Goodbye. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Was I not supposed to do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, as ever, we need to practice one of these one of these fancy sign off things that all of us the podcast do, where they all do their their buys sort of simultaneous and stuff. Or should we just not bother and just do what we normally do? Let's do what we normally do. All right. Bye. All that remains to be said then is thank you once again to uh, Mr. Mike Whittaker. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, to the Welsh wizard himself, uh, joining us off, the, off his deathbed. What, what a trooper. Curses, foil again. Ha <laughs> I'm still alive. Indeed. Thank you very much. And and yeah, and more importantly, guys, thank you f- uh, to li- for listening. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the show. Yeah, we'll we'll speak to you very soon. So until next time, happy gaming. Take care. We'll see you soon. Good night. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with others by leaving us a review on iTunes? And if you have any comments or questions, you can always email the show. The address is info at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk And you can also visit our webpage, where you'll find a complete episode archive, all the View from the Veranda podcasts, rules reviews, and our blog of hobby items and news, which is updated several times a week. This is also where you'll find the links to our presence on social media. And here you can follow us on Twitter or join our Facebook group. And finally, here you can also find details should you wish to support us by making a donation to the podcast. All this on the Meeples and Miniatures website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.